Where are you going? What are you searching for? Do you see meaning and light in the journey of life? Or do you hide from the truth in the darkness and night? Are you dreaming? What's the meaning? Every second that passes is gone forever. Yesterday's pile up, tomorrow might never arrive. Blessed to be alive. Today's the day to open your eyes. You are not that body you inhabit. You are not your thoughts or your actions. You are not your worst moment or your deepest passion. You are a non-material entity of consciousness. Spirit, see, be, dreaming, feeling. A spark of a greater flame. A part of a greater name. The mind is the companion. The soul is the self. The body, the vehicle, knowledge is wealth. Illuminate the darkness with the truth. And when the shadows recede, you see you were never alone and you'll never be. The witness resides deep inside. The one from which you come and when this is all done, you will return to his side. The absolute being, the eternal supreme, the fountain head of life, the source of the light. Through the song, pure sound written in these pages, passed down by the sages, we can know who we are and where we'll go, how to act, how to be, how to serve, how to see, how to love, how to be free. Find yourself in the song, Angita Jayanti. Krishna and welcome back to World Gita Day. We have just had a seven hour break from leaving Fiji and we're still on our whirlwind tour of the whole entire globe celebrating the timeless wisdom of the Bhagavad Gita. We travel through Australia, Japan, Thailand, India, Fiji and New Zealand all of yesterday or at least for me it's yesterday and um, getting a chance to meet wonderful devotees all across the world who have been celebrating the Bhagavad Gita and sharing this timeless wisdom with everyone. We are very excited to continue on with many other countries today, including Russia, North America, Latin America, um, Africa, and Europe. I have said them all in the wrong order, but I promise you'll be reaching all of those wonderful places. Um, we are excited to have everybody on YouTube and on Facebook and I believe on YouTube, you will see a little scroller at the bottom of your screen uh, and you'll see all the wonderful things that keep coming through. I apologize. I keep laughing. I am trying not to use uh, very simple adjectives like wonderful. So I apologize. So you'll see all the names of the amazing, amazing devotees all across the world who are um, helping to share the Bhagavad Gita and distribute all across the world. And if you haven't heard yet, we have an amazing, amazing goal this year. Uh, not just a hundred books across the globe, not even 200. Uh, we are trying to distribute 2.2 million Bhagavad Gita's across the world. Um, not an easy feat by any means. And we are trying to unite all together as a team to reach this fantastic goal. So today we're starting off our festivities, our celebration with Russia. And we're very excited to introduce both Ranga Naiki and Ranga Priya. Hare Krishna. Hare, Hare Krishna. Krishna. <laughs> they are the wonderful um, contributors and uh, organizers of our Russian tour. And, you know, I pass it over to you to hear a little bit about you and to introduce yourselves. As Hare Krishna, we are so happy to join this wonderful celebration of Bhagavad Gita and World Gita Day. We were so happy to join the, uh, 
previous year and um, we are Krishna twins, uh, <laughs> Rang and I, Kiran Gafriya, you can confuse, it's okay. And um, we like to travel and of course it's nice uh, that you will join our traveling now into Russia and we dive into cold Russia, but uh, with a very hard, uh, with a hot hearted people. <laughs> <laughs> and um, 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 although we are dis uh, distributing books all over the world, not only in Russia, so this um, Gita Day, Jayanti Day, is very um, inspiring for us because it unites uh, every uh, all countries, and mm -hmm. uh, we know personally we have this experience that um, Gita uh, um, unite everybody in. Each country, you can find um, the, uh, what is good for you, and uh, you can find the answers for all the questions in your heart, spiritual questions. And so, so we are happy. So we, when we were traveling with you around the world, we know some places we were visited by ourselves. So it was wonderful for us to meet uh, devotees, uh, some devotees which you know. And uh, of course, uh, we have this uh, experience. I want to share with it to you. Before it, we were, uh, before started to distribute books all over the world, we were traveling around the world with the hip hop dances. <laughs> we were uh, very much cool. Able. <laughs> yes, so so we have a lot of artistic uh, um, uh, videos prepared, prepared, to... prepared for you. Nice uh, show. <laughs> yeah, I'm not excited. <laughs> I, I'm not surprised. Sorry, I didn't say I meant to say I'm not surprised that um, you both are, are such talented devotees. So I'm so excited to see what you have planned You're, uh, and for everybody else. Uh, it's quite an artistic, uh, talented group that you've put together. So let's get to it. So can can you describe um, what our first act will be? Um, uh, first video. Uh, this is very dear for us because this is like a uh, him for World Gita Day. And, mm. um, Mata Jin Rissimchi, uh, Natalia Mitelena. She is a very... Um, gentle, um, kind, uh, caring person, and she's very talented. Uh, she um, uh, got a lot of music schools, and uh, one of them is the, one of the best uh, music school in Russia. Uh, mm -hmm. So she teach uh, um, many people how to sing and uh, give them uh, spiritual inspiration. Also, she had a theater, and she is a Harinam leader <laughs> uh, during the maybe three months uh, summertime. She's doing Harinam every day, leading Harinam groups, and uh, she's very famous in Russia uh, from this uh, side also. That is amazing. So let's take a look at Nasimi Mataji. Люди так не похожи, разные их пути, но ты пришел в этот мир не один. Люди ведь знать не могут, что ждет их впереди, но ты пришел в этот мир не один. И когда мы ищем ответы, Поднимая взгляд в небеса, слышим ты голоса. Это люди вновь и вновь ищут на земле. И не сойдешь с пути, ты пришел в этот мир не один. И 
когда мы ищем ответы, поднимая взгляд в небеса, слышим ты. Поднимая взгляд в небеса You said that was a hymn. That didn't sound like a hymn. That sounded like a battle cry, like an anthem. That was strong way to start off our program in Russia. And what an amazing voice she has. Yes. And uh, this uh, name of the song is Million Voices. And she made this video especially for this day. We were very grateful for her. She had just uh, about maybe a couple of days and she write this song by herself and organize all these videos, these children, this, her friends. Small That's so heartwarming. The- I mean, you know, sometimes we have um, acts that, you know, throughout the year. And because she's such a famous singer, you would think that that's something that she's just come up, that she's had a while ago and we've just, we're using it for today. But yeah, mind blowing. <laughs> incredible, incredible, incredible. I, um, so I'm literally blown away to hear that. I did not expect to hear that. So thank you for sharing that. Um, are we ready to go on to the next uh, part of yes. our, to, uh, our session today? Uh, now we are going to dive into the philosophy because the next mm. uh, video uh, will be with um, um, Vladimir Slipsov, Vaimiki Prabhu. Maybe you mm. know him. Uh, he's a very strong preacher in Russia. Also, he is a professional yoga teacher and making a lot of tours in Himalayas and uh, sharing with the Vedic knowledge to all the people. And um, interesting thing that he organized a um, very nice farm uh, planet of cows in Omsk city and even administrators of the city appreciate this job and they gave him a big premium for it and uh, he's a strong preacher he's a philosopher and let's see what he's talking about Bhagavad Gita fantastic Владимир, день добрый. Здравствуйте. Скажите, пожалуйста, как Бхагавадгита изменила вашу жизнь? Наверное, это лучшее изменение в моей жизни. Изменения всегда происходят в жизни. Говорится, каждую секунду мы можем чувствовать изменения в жизни. Настроение может меняться от погоды, просто от присутствия людей или от аромата цветов может измениться настроение. То есть постоянно что-то меняется, как говорится. Единственное, что стабильное в этом мире, то, что никогда не меняется, это изменения. То есть они всегда происходят. Но те изменения, которые произошли в моей жизни при появлении Бхагавадгиты, они, похоже, являются самыми существенными. Почему? Потому что... У меня такой склад ума, постоянно находиться в поиске абсолютно истины, что-то новое, 
То есть очень так скрупулезно изучать философии разные. И до появления моей жизни Бхагавадгиты я читал много разных книг. И всегда чувствовал какую-то, ну, не то чтобы неудовлетворенность, а как будто бы я чего-то не дочитываю. То есть чего-то не хватает. Не однажды мне дали Бхагавадгиту, причем дали ее с, э, с таким желанием, чтобы я ее прочитал и вернул. Я подумал, ну похоже, это какая-то серьезная книга, раз просят вернуть. Обычно дают книгу и как подарок, вот, но вернуть нужно. Вернуть, потому что она ценная была для человека. И <клёх> где-то с пяти вечера до четырех утра я ее читал без остановки. То есть я никогда в жизни не читал так долго книг. И, похоже, это единственный вариант, когда я так долго читал без остановки книгу. И я не мог остановиться, потому что чем больше я читал, тем больше я понимал, что ну, жажда моя, она усиливается. Обычно, когда человек испытывает жажду, он пьет и насыщается, и в какой-то момент все, пресыщение уже есть. Здесь же наоборот. То есть, чем больше пьешь, тем больше хочется пить. И от вот этого состояния, удивительного состояния, что эта жажда усиливается, я чувствовал вот эти изменения в сердце, потому что одно то, что где-то со второй главы я уже читал санскрит, причем мне казалось, что я его знаю, этот санскрит, и читается он как песня, то есть он звучит как что-то такое необычное, то есть неземное, то есть ваш интеллект он превращается в неземной интеллект, то есть вы читаете какие-то а, слова неземные, и они у вас звучат очень хорошо. Эта вибрация очень глубоко проникает в сознание и там создает вот эту жажду, то есть охота пить, пить послание, которое есть в этой книге. Чем она еще мне понравилась, я отследил, что оказывается это единственная книга на планете, где всю книгу Бог говорит. То есть буквально всю, там в нескольких местах там ученик задает вопросы, а в основном всю книгу он говорит. Причем нету никаких противоречий, нет никаких сомнений, что это говорит Верховная Личность Бога. И поэтому это все хорошо укладывается. Вот один из критериев того, что я нашел свой путь, это то, что нет никаких противоречий. То есть все знания, которые там вытекали и втекали в мое сознание, они просто находили место для как бы, надежды, что это знание я однажды буду применять на практике. И так и произошло. Буквально уже на следующий день я попросил а, также у этого человека, а, попросил четки, потому что это то, что и оттуда вычленил. То есть благодаря четкам, то есть или вот этой вспомогательной практике медитативной, для того, чтобы успокаивать ум, его останавливать, его занимать, скажем так, в его интеллектуальной деятельности. Нужна медитация, и четко это как раз то, что помогает. И уже на следующий день я уже погружался в медитацию и понимал, что эта книга даже еще не открылась для меня. Она просто попала мне в руки. И где-то на третий раз, наверное, на третий раз, когда ее... Начинал читать, я понимал, вот сейчас она открывает завесу какую-то в другую реальность, как бы к себе домой, вы как бы дверь открываете к себе домой. Вот в этом ценность ее. То есть каждый раз, когда а, кажется, что в безвыходной ситуации вас где-то вот застали, да, или вы хотите решить какую-то проблему, или наоборот, восхититься чем-то удивительным, а нужно просто открывать Бхагавадгиту, и она будет открывать вход в любое измерение этой Вселенной. Вот такая ценность Бхагавадгиты. И каждый раз теперь читая ее каждый день, ну или почти что каждый день, читая ее, вы каждый раз что-то новое для себя открываете. При этом она настолько универсальная, что она помогает всем. Как говорится, Бог один, и знание о Боге, оно тоже одно. Тем более оно непосредственно от Него идет. И эти книги читают, я знаю, люди разных традиций, люди разных конфессии, люди разного склада ума, читают и чиновники, и доктора, читают и ученые, и просто рабочие, и бизнесмены. И она ко всем подходит, это универсальный ключ к самосознанию. 
никто не останется равнодушным, просто открыв ее, прочитав там несколько строк. Они очень надолго будут находиться в этом состоянии, в состоянии счастья. Путь этот радостно говорится. Там же Бхагавадгите Бог говорит, что знание это вечное постижение, его радостно. Вот этот критерий, он по-прежнему ну, актуален, и он работает, мы это видим. Но ну, я во всяком случае постоянно это чувствую. Поэтому я всем желаю, разумным людям, иметь эту книгу как главное руководство к действию, или главный поводырь, или главный ориентир на пути к трансцендентному, или на пути домой к Богу. Это главный наш навигатор. Этим могут пользоваться все люди этого мира. Желаю всем успехов в духовной жизни, постижения своей природы духовной и постижения абсолютной истины. Welcome back. What an insightful session with Val Valmiki Prabhu. Uh, there's so many gems to unpack in what he said. What something that um, touched my heart was uh, he mentioned that no person who's even read just a few lines of the Bhagavad Gita is left an unchanged person. And uh, how true that is for, I think, many people who have read the Bhagavad Gita or I've touched the Bhagavad Gita or have just opened up a page of the Bhagavad Gita that they feel transformed um, with that. And I loved his examples. He mentioned, uh, you know, when a thirsty person drinks water, they feel full. But with the Bhagavad Gita, that's the exact opposite. The more you drink, the more you need to, dr to drink more, you need to read more. Um, so what a what a session full of conviction about the importance and the impact and the transformation of the Bhagavad Gita. Yes, you know, and I want to share the story when I was uh, listening also the uh, Valmiki Prabhu. I remember how we uh, were attracted by Bhagavad Gita because he's uh, told that even you touch Bhagavad Gita and even you, um, um, if you read Bhagavad Gita, you can take uh, something important in your life. And, you know, we have this real experience, that extreme experience, extreme experience <laughs> that it's uh, the um, message of Bhagavad Gita. There was one sentence, but this sentence saved our life. And it was may maybe about 12 years ago, and we were in very difficult, dangerous situation for our life. And China. We were in China, we were Shanghai, in Shanghai, <laughs> and we were. I, it's um, to to make a story short. I just say that it was very dangerous situation, and uh, at that at that moment uh, we uh, think that oh we we are really in difficult situation. Maybe we uh, we don't know what we, we don't know what 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 will be the finish. Maybe we will, mm -hmm. what will be the consequence. Yeah. Be, yes, and then. Um, Uh, we had this uh, uh, sentence uh, from Bhagavad Gita. We don't have uh, Bhagavad Gita, but we have this sentence uh, about Bhagavad Gita that it is said, that whatever a person think at the last moment uh, of his life, when mm -hmm. he's keeping his body and so on, uh, this is the most important uh, moment. And uh, mm, you, you can achieve whatever you think that you achieve, the soul achieved this. Uh, And that, that is very important to, uh, to chant Hare Krishna Mantra. We never chant Hare Krishna Maha Mantra before. And, um, and at the dangerous moment of our life, we start to think what I have uh, good in my life, what I ha have to think about. Because in this uh, uh, book, it was said that it is very important to think about uh, something uh, spiritual and we thought we had a, a hip-hop career we were famous we have everything good in our life and we think oh and when we start to think that uh, about importance of this um, life you understand that you have uh, uh, your life is not so deep and this phrase uh, um, how to say, uh, make us uh, thinking about what is the most important uh, in our life and the essence, the essence of our life. And then we, uh, when we read in the book that the most important in uh, 
every life of every person is to uh, chant Hare Krishna to think about uh, God uh, himself. And we think, okay, I don't know. I don't have any option. I don't know what I have <laughs> important in my life. But in this book, it is said that it's the most, uh, the best thing you can do. And we start to change Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, a chant, uh, how we understand it without uh, bees and so on, just like seeds, like yogi. And uh, this uh, saved our life. And when we come back to Russia, we um, we joined the Krishna consciousness movement. We already accept everything. We were so much admired by this philosophy and this knowledge. It, it wow. was like a like a fairy tale, but it was a, a <laughs> real tr a truth <laughs> fairy tale. Well, we ask our, our hosts to be personal, and this is uh, quite the personal story <laughs> that you were faced with such danger, and, and the Bhagavad Gita literally saved your lives. I mean, what an incredible story. <laughs> yes. When Thank you, you for the Bhagavad Gita, you're very much assured that it is saved lives. In the Especially in dangerous situations. You better yeah. open up that Bhagavad Gita right, by your, right, right in your backpack. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing. So we're going to head off to our next session, our next act. Um, and I believe that's Nilambri. Yes, uh, Nilambri. If you like this video, it is very short, but it's quite deep because uh, Nilambri is very deep, very talented, uh, determined, uh, focused person. Uh, and uh, she is writing uh, the music by herself and Nilambri is a, a project, a family project. Uh, with uh, Matija Nilambri, uh, she has a very nice husband, Sundar Govinda Prabhu, who is leading Harinals, who has do so much uh, um, artistic work for uh, temples, and um, they are very great family. I, I suppose they give so much. Uh, professional and uh, yes and deep uh, realizations with their artworks so especially uh, what is nice that uh, they uh, do especially for Bhagavad Gita uh, um, glorifying Bhagavad Gita so many things with uh, beautiful videos music videos so you can let's check it out <laughs> <laughs> Sarvasya chaham Ridhi sannivishto Mata smriti Gyanam apohanam cha Vedescha sarvai Okay, that looked like it came straight out of a movie. That's not believable. <laughs> um, I think what we're seeing, you know, in the last few acts, and I imagine we'll see for the following acts, is um, taking the teachings of the Bhagavad Gita and using your own talents to help um, uh, emphasize or share it or focus in a different way. 
than we normally would. I think many people um, may have the understanding that the Bhagavad Gita is something we just read and then we close the book and we put it back on our shelf. Um, but these devotees are showing that um, you take that Bhagavad Gita, you open it, you read it, and you try to imbibe the teachings in such a way that you can use your own talents to help uh, share it. And these devotees are doing such a great job of it. Yes, also the, when such artistic people started to practicing and using Bhagavad Gita, applying this Bhagavad Gita knowledge in their life, their artistic life become more deep, more influenced. I have a lot of singers who share that their even voice changes when they started to uh, practice spiritual life, their voice changed. Not only like a professional, but <laughs> spiritual. Yeah, these talents, they're um, certainly God-given, you know, they, they're, they're things that they've practiced, but just seeing the, how it's changed their lives to use <clears throat> their talents in the service of the Supreme, we're seeing the effects of it and we're enjoying the effects of it right now. Where are we going to next? Next will be our um, a very good friend. He's a sportsman, Pavel Nosov. We like him very much because <laughs> he's so peaceful. He, you know, he's very strong in martial arts, but he's so positive, peaceful. Never, you never will uh, uh, expect that he's so strong and so brutal. So, you know. Uh, even uh, can be aggressive in uh, fighting. In life, he's very positive. He's very good husband, very good uh, family man, um, and very friendly. So uh, it's obvious and uh, not surprising that he attracted by Bhagavad Gita knowledge because Bhagavad Gita starts with the battlefield mm -hmm. and knows it very close, mm -hmm. <laughs> very good that uh, what it is battlefield and e each sportsman, even we are dancers when we take part in battles, break competitions, break dance battles, you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, you have judges, you have crowds, and you have your opponent, and you should be focused on, on what you do and be in, in one way with the music. And uh, uh, you know that enemy is not outside, he is inside. <laughs> and uh, uh, so he knows it very well. And uh, it's, it will be interesting to listen from him he's um, also, also he's uh, uh, maybe took a couple of years he got a uh, um, world world award he's a, a superman <laughs> or jiu jitsu uh, world, world champion. champion yeah, yeah that's so Vegas. incredible yes he got this uh, award in las vegas uh, so he's a superstar <laughs> well let's hear from the superstar Humble superstar. <laughs> <laughs> Интересно, а как вели себя вот эти вот величайшие войны истории, о чем они размышляли, момент битвы, перед битвой, как они себя настраивали перед поединком. Мне было очень интересно почитать, и когда я начал 
читая эту книгу, я понял, что насколько огромный и глубокий смысл заложен. И там далеко не про войну, не про сражение, а можно сказать, смысл всей нашей жизни. И я рекомендую Багавадгиту как настольную книгу каждому из нас. Особенно в наше время, когда сесть почитать, это уделить время, это большая роскошь. И на самом деле Багавадгиту не нужно читать два часа, час. Достаточно даже прочитать одну главу, четыре стиши и комментарии к ней, и поразмышлять над этим. Рекомендуют ее еще почитать, перечитывать несколько раз. И на самом деле, когда ты перечитываешь ее, начинаешь, она открыла, книга открывается перед тобой в каком-то другом ракурсе. Начинаешь понимать какие-то вещи, которые ты не понимал, и сейчас они кажутся для тебя какие-то очевидные, а ты тогда то ли от невнимательности, может быть, другое время было, ты не осознавал этого, но ты начинаешь больше и больше углубляться в ответы на свои какие-то личные вопросы. Поэтому всем ищущим, задающим вопросы непростые, я рекомендую прочитать Магавадгиту и думаю, вы найдете там стоящие ответы. Всем спасибо, всего доброго. So inspiring to hear from him. Uh, like you said, he, the clips that were shown first, I mean, he has quite some strength in him and I can see how he's a, a world world champion, but uh, his uh, speech is um, impeccable in that he is sharing such practical tips. I like that he mentioned that, um, and we've been hearing this quite a bit, but it's nice to hear it over and over again, that um, you don't need to read the Bhagavad Gita for two hours or an hour even just reading one verse at a time and meditating upon it, it can answer so many of the questions that we may have about our lives. Um, so very inspiring. I, I really appreciated you bringing him into our, our, our segment today that um, we got to hear from him. Uh, seems like a very friendly giant. <laughs> Definitely. And, uh, what a, go ahead, sorry, I was gonna say, if you can introduce the next act. Yeah, and uh, next video is, um, um uh, dance modern dance uh mahirata uh madhuchi mahirata and karuneshwari they did this dance especially for this day and uh, connecting with the verses of bhagavad gita inspired by gita jaya today lovely let's take a look Я да я да хит хармас 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 планир бавати пара 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 а будто нам от хармас от хармас тадат по нам стричан я хам я хам я хам Я да сам харате чаям, курмон гани васарваша, индрия не индрия кипья, да с я прочна протишки дашь. Ман мана бава мат бакто. Мам, я джи нам на маску руку, Мам, эвайш я сисать им те, Протиджане приёси мы.
Sarva Dharman Paritya Mam Ekam Sharanam Racha Aham Tvam Sarva Papi Pyo Mokshai Shyami Mashcha The talent is surely overflowing from Russia today. Um, I imagine it happens all the time, but today we're really getting a, a very sweet treat by seeing all this wonderful talent. And um, we get to overemphasize the fact that the Bhagavad Gita is limitless in the way that we can apply it in our lives, whether it's through uh, fighting, jujitsu fighting, whether it's dancing, whether it's singing. So I'm really excited to hear what's happening next. And the next, uh, we will uh, dive into the music again. Uh, it's a nice group, at No No. Um, Alexei Mishkin is the leader of this group. They, uh, yes, they start as uh, rap guys <laughs> doing rap. Cool. And now they uh, grow into many genres, uh, music band, and uh, even ethnic music they uh, use. And, uh, uh, on their concert, they always talk with the public and talk about the principle of Bhagavad Gita. Even in their songs, they use some uh, um, verses from Bhagavad Gita and this knowledge. So they're nice preachers, nice uh, uh, performers. performers. And even we uh, came on their perform uh, performance in uh, Sochi. Uh, and uh, Alexei Mishkin, uh, he uh, present his new book. It's a boss. He's a poet. He's not only a singer, he's a poet by himself. And uh, he uh, presented his uh, book called uh, uh, Music in Words. Music in Words. And uh, in these books, in his poetry, so many uh, principles from Bhagavad Gita so nicely. Um, uh, he do it and represent it for public. So Incredible. Many. Can't wait to see it. See it. <laughs> <laughs> Меня зовут Алексей Мышкин, я участник музыкальной группы «Одно но». Я искренне хочу посоветовать вам прочитать одну удивительную книгу. Она называется «Бхагавад Гид». Я сам пишу стихи и филолог по образованию, поэтому я могу по достоинству оценить весь масштаб этой книги, ее поэтическую красоту и философское содержание. Лев Толстой говорил, что... Бхагавад Гита и вообще наука о Кришне является изначальным источником всех духовных традиций мира. А поэт Максимилиан Волошин считал, что Бхагавад Гита – одно из величайших Евангелий этого мира. Более того, Бхагавад Гита она работает в жизни, в часы трудностей, переживаний, потерь Бхагавад Гита – сможет стать тем источником, который напитает сердце верой и подарит действительно глубокое умиротворение. Бхагавадгита спасала меня много-много раз, поэтому дайте возможность Гите быть вашим духовным учителем и поводырем. Читайте Гиту. Коснувшись к единому ритму, звучи И понимаем друг друга без слов Звучи Incredible. I like how he described the Bhagavad Gita as poetic beauty. I'm going to use that from now on. Didn't think of the Bhagavad Gita as a poem, but I, I really enjoyed hearing from him and his simple instruction at the end. Read Gita. <laughs> simple and sweet. Yes. And the next video, uh, is a, will be a very nice lady. She's an actress. 
She's acting in films, TV series, um, especially in comedies. She likes uh, good uh, films with, about family life n n without any violence and so on. She's very um, you know, people. And at, at the same time, she's very energetic, very determined lady. And uh, it was very nice story about how she acquaintance with Bhagavad Gita, very nice story about her dreams, she will tell it in the video. And she now she is also a producer and make uh, her uh, own films. Uh, and it is very nice because she will do it in a nice way. <laughs> and uh, well, she did uh, two short films, you know, um, and uh, even got some awards. Uh, got some awards, yes. And uh, now she is uh, writing a screen uh, screenplay for mm -hmm. a new film, and uh, she is very talented. Also, she's a family lady. She got ch nice child, and uh, she do uh, so many things. And you will see her energetic. Love. Здравствуйте, дорогие друзья! Меня зовут Евгения Туркова, я актриса театра и кино, кинорежиссер и педагог. А скажите, если не секрет, почему именно врача? Не секрет. От врачей очень многое зависит. Прежде всего, жизнь человека. Угу. Хорошие врачи, они спасают, а плохие убивают. Я надеюсь стать хорошим врачом. Сегодня я хотела рассказать вам о такой необыкновенной книге, удивительной, которая называется «Бхагавад Гита. Как она есть?». Написал ее святой, его божественная милость Прабхупада. Это необычная книга, это личность Бога. Ну, сейчас вам это будет сложно осознать, вы скажете, что я сумасшедшая. Я на самом деле, когда мне эта книга попала 8 лет назад, прочитав ее не до конца, думаю, какая классная философия, столько мудрости, но вот сектантская. Все мне там, все к одному, э, все время мне говорят, что нужно какую-то мантру повторять. Думаю, вот зачем я буду повторять мантру? Ну, глупость какая-то. Я вот так, ну, отложила эту книгу. Я так по маме скучаю. А потом, э, спустя время, я начала слушать ведические лекции духовных учителей, где они начали рассказывать вообще что эта книга, два Гавадгида, это книга вообще лидера. И здесь можно, читая ее, на многие вопросы, почти на все, ну не почти на все вопросы ответить в своей жизни. Как в своей профессии быть, как вообще жить, как свою личность развивать, как с ребенком себя вести, как с мужем, как с мамой, как с папой. То есть, то есть ответы на все вопросы. И самое главное это... Ответ на то, зачем я вообще здесь, для чего я здесь, на этой земле родился, какая у меня должна быть цель моей жизни. То есть это настолько глубокая книга, сейчас это, она у меня главная книга моей жизни, она у меня на столике стоит. И эта сейчас книга также помогает писать мне мой новый сценарий, главный в моей жизни, который пришел ко мне... Господь мне дал этот сценарий, когда мне было 17 лет, как дал, просто пришло мне поток, мне приснился сон, и потом я написала сценарий в 17 лет. И я поставила себе цель, что я стану э, драматургом, режиссером, и обязательно сниму фильм, который будет изменять сердца других людей, и которые будут, э, э, которые научатся любить Бога. Или по, по крайней мере будут приходить к Богу благодаря моим фильмам. И вот сейчас я пишу сценарий к фильму, который называется Пропасть, он как раз про Бога. И эта книга очень помогает мне, она отвечает на многие вопросы. Я вообще изучала, для того, чтобы написать этот сценарий, свою пропасть, я изучала многие духовные традиции, сейчас продолжаю изучать. Но именно эта книга помогает мне э, этот сценарий сделать настоящим, таким, э, которым его увидят зрители, чтобы поменять свои сердца. В общем, дорогие друзья, если вы еще не читали эту книгу, я вам очень рекомендую ее. И относитесь вот к ней не предвзято, как к какой-то сектантской литературе, а просто ну, попробуйте ее прочитать своим сердцем. Можно даже задать какой-то себе вопрос. Вот часто бывает какой-то вот вопрос жизненный, необходимый. Вот я не могу разрешить какую-то ситуацию в своем сердце. Можно просто открыть какой-то, задать вопрос Богу, открыть страницу любую, да, вот 
которая вам откроется, и прочесть. И а, вот, например, открыла я. Знаешь же, что все это сотворенные существа покоятся во мне, подобно тому, как могучий ветер, который дует повсюду, всегда остается в небе. То есть уже прочитав этот комментарий, можно что-то понять, какой-то ответ придет на ваш вопрос. Рекомендую Бхагавадгиту, друзья мои. Она просто будет спасать вас по жизни. Особенно в наше время, непростое, когда ковид бушует, когда очень тяжело, когда умирают близкие и родные, и друзья, и родственники. А это прям спасение. Все? Well, you weren't kidding when you said that she's a very determined and, con and woman of full conviction. Um, you can see that very evident in how she spoke. And I enjoyed that she shared her personal struggle with the Bhagavad Gita initially, um, that it was not something that she understood right away um, or wanted to because she felt this book is telling me to chant a mantra and I don't want to chant a mantra. <laughs> um, but with the help of guides and spiritual uh, teachings, hearing about the Bhagavad Gita in a practical way, it really transformed her life. And you can see that in, in her beautiful conviction. Yes, definitely. She's very sincere. <laughs> mm -hmm. Where are we headed off to next? I know I keep uh, pushing us along, but we have many countries to visit afterwards. So please tell us about um, Nelson. Oh, Irina Nelson, she's so feminine, she's so beautiful, a very uh, famous uh, superstar, pop superstar in Russia, and she started her career in a band, uh, Reflex, and in 19, uh, she was extremely famous in this, uh, in this group. And uh, later she uh, were attracted by yoga, different practices, uh, and uh, it leads her to Bhagavad Gita. And in this video, she will share with this, uh, with all of us. Also, she's still uh, in her 50, about, she's about 50, and she's still very beautiful and very popular on Instagram. Uh, she has about a million followers and wow. on, yes, and on her page she's promoting healthy life uh, vegetarian yoga meditation and she speaks about Bhagavad Gita also so Incredible. Let's, yeah let's take a look Кто-то, так сказать, встает на скользкую дорогу, когда у него mm. наступают какие-то такие трудные ситуации. Мне хватило силы духа и ума пойти купить умных книг. Недалеко от меня находился магазин «Путь к себе», oh, где продавалась различная эзотерическая литература. И когда я туда вошла и попала, я думаю, ну надо же, вот они ответы, вот они лежат, бери и пользуйся. И я начала читать. Я поймала себя на мысли, что я Бхагавадгиту как явление, оно намного шире, чем я себе представляла. Когда я узнала о том, что Бхагавадгита существует в нескольких изданиях, что она трактовалась очень многими, и даже совсем недавно, девочки, знаете или нет, наш знаменитый рок-музыкант да. Борис Григорьевичков, да. для меня это было колоссальным удивлением и почтением этого, этому человеку за то, что, оказывается, он всю свою жизнь исследовал это. Все счастье, которое приходит в этом материальном мире, оно, собственно, приходит, уходит, оно не бывает постоянным. И я начала задуматься о том, что есть же какие-то вещи, которые постоянны. Есть постоянное счастье, но не больше такого быть, чтобы мы родились и э, постоянно нас, так сказать, кидало из огня до полымя. Что есть какое-то, существует абсолютное счастье, абсолютная радость. И я не ошиблась.
Mm-hmm. Astounding. Um, I think I'm sensing a theme with the Russian devotees that um, Russian devotees are not okay with one title. They're not just a singer. They're a singer, philosopher, yoga teacher. <laughs> so many different things after their name. It's so incredible to see that they, they're not happy with one talent. They're, they need multiple talents to, to have. Um, incredible. Very uh, amazing. And like you said, she's so beautiful. She does not look 50 years old. She looks much younger. <laughs> Yes, and that's why she has so many followers because she's uh, I can imagine. reaching by her own uh, appearance, even. Mm-hmm. by her own example. Yes, mm-hmm. and um, uh, what about next video? Uh, yes, we're going to Aradia Kishori. Aradia Kishori, Alina Krichok. We like her very much. She's a very interesting person. Uh, she's um, very talented, artistic. Uh, she's also a nice mother. You will see it in the video. And uh, she's um, uh, took part in many exhibitions, uh, watercolors uh, of water uh, colorists, mm-hmm. and uh, not only in Russia but also all over the world in different. Uh, Places also in Korea. I know she took part in some exhibition. Her uh, artworks uh, t- took part in this exhibition, and uh, also she um, had a lot of um, um, her works. And the, these artworks are in many countries, not only in Russia, but in many private collections, like in Kazakhstan, Belarus, Canada, USA, India, and. Uh, many other countries and uh, she's very talented nice and lady also her husband is very talented <laughs> also he's a professional actor maybe we will see him next year, <laughs> this year you need to well. share you need to share the talent all across the world it's unfair that you have it all there <laughs> all right let's take a look with Aradia Kishori <laughs> Всем привет, меня зовут Алина Третьёк, многие знают меня под именем Аграда Кишори, это мое духовное имя. В этом видео я расскажу немного о себе, о моём творчестве и как Бхагавдгита может вдохновлять творение. На данном этапе жизни я мать, художница, жена и балансирую между этими ролями. Я стараюсь наполнить свою жизнь смыслом. Я считаю, что жизни, которые не имеют такой духовной цели, в конце концов приводят лишь к разочарованию и к страданию. Так как все в этой жизни не вечное, и когда будем оставлять тело, мы не сможем что-то забрать с собой. И поэтому меня вдохновляет стих из Бхагавадгиты, вторая, вторая глава, сороковой те- текст. «Тот, кто встал на этот путь, ничего не теряет, и ни одно его усилие не пропадет даром. И даже незначительное усилие по этому пути может привести, оградить человека от величайшей опасности». Тот талант, который у меня есть, я тоже не смогу забрать в конце жизни. Но я стараюсь его развивать и стараюсь занять его служением другим людям. Я стараюсь посредством своей картины вдохновлять других людей. Я стремлюсь сделать их сердце немножко чище, чем оно есть. И когда это получается, я вижу, как сама становлюсь лучше и вдохновляюсь. Мне нравится моя деятельность делать то, что тебя вдохновляет, и при этом это приносит счастье еще и другим людям. Это большая удача. Я с восьмого класса решила стать художницей, когда мне было 13 лет. Но мне понадобилось 18 лет, чтобы понять, какой мой любимый материал, что бы я хотела изображать. Но в этих работах не было меня, 
ну, то есть эти работы не характеризовали меня как личность, поэтому они лишались э, смысла и какой-то энергии, которая, на мой взгляд, должна нести в себе картину. Когда я рисую, я вижу, как моя жизнь становится лучше. И, как я говорила, она приобретает какой-то смысл в моей жизни. Чувствую свою удачу, потому что я заняла свою природу и могу служить людям. Это непростой путь, но в Богородвите есть такой стих, вторая глава, 14 стих, что счастье и горе сменяют друг друга, как зима и лето. Но нужно терпеливо переносить все страдания, оставаясь невозмутимыми. Поступками на пути славы и других и проблем мы можем добиться всех поставленных целей. И это то, что мне помогает справляться с трудностями именно конкретных стихов из головы. Я желаю вам ставить высокие духовные цели. И читайте богатиту и будьте счастливы. Машиночки. Вот так. Пока-пока. Пока-пока. Unbelievable to take such a hard medium like watercolor. And if anybody has tried, I have some watercolors here and I can literally just paint a streak across a canvas, um, to take that incredibly hard medium and like it, transform a canvas into something that's straight out of the spiritual world. Incredible. Um, I, I, I really appreciated the points that she was saying. And I think more than anything, I appreciated the fact that she was trying to paint with a baby ne next to her. That's not easy. <laughs> um, <laughs> to see the essence um, of the person and uh, of the um, situations. That's why she uh, paints so nicely. Mm -hmm. And her simple endeavor to see that everyone who has a chance to look at her artwork um, can cleanse their heart. I thought that was such a beautiful um, endeavor that she, or intention that she had behind her paintings. Well, we're almost at the end of Russia. Unfortunately, we have two more acts. Um, so we are going to hear from Deva, Deviatova. Yes. Deviatova. Yes, Marina Deviatova. So many singers we have today. <laughs> Russian uh, likes to sing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's uh, quite strange maybe for us because we have a lot of dancers, friends, uh, devotees, dancers, but uh, now we show videos of singers uh, today and she is uh, very special. Uh, she is extraordinary um, lady and she is very determined also like uh, Turkova <laughs> and uh, uh, she she is representing Russian culture in other countries. She's mm. a best yeah, yeah, she's a very Russian. She she <laughs> sings uh, national Russian traditional. songs. Yeah, very traditional. And even she make a show uh, in the Kremlin uh, in Moscow uh, in front of the president of our country, Vladimir Putin. Uh, and she also took part in many TV programs uh, because she represents Russian culture and everybody likes to invite her. The shows and she shows always Russian costumes, very Russian, 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 <laughs> but it doesn't contradict with her love to India culture. And we will see it in the video <laughs> what she very said cool. about Bhagavad Gita and uh, because Bhagavad Gita not only Indian, but it's for all uh, countries, all people all over the world because it's uh, the principles are very universe. And uh, she applies this principle in her life. She's a very good wife, uh, uh, even when she's a very strong woman who manages mm -hmm. all these concerts. She's not always a singer. She's also a manager. She's doing a lot of things. And her uh, life is very intensive. But Can't wait to see this multi-talented person. Yeah. <laughs> Малым 
Много лет назад э, мне в руки попала эта книга «Пагавад Гита». Э, всю свою жизнь я искала Бога. И я рада тому, что эта книга подарила мне самое главное – счастье. Подарила мне понимание э, того, что Господь есть. И мне очень хочется вам, дорогие мои, посоветовать, в первую очередь, да просто ее поддержать, потому что дальше чудеса начинают происходить в жизни, и от страницы к странице вы все чаще задаете сами себе вопрос, а кто же я, а где же я, а зачем же я живу на этой земле? Этот вопрос задавала и я себе. Я постаралась сама себе на него ответить, но в том числе, конечно же, мне помогли э, строки, стихи. Я очень рада тому, что эта книга идет со мной по жизни. Багаваткида, как она есть? easy, right? When we, when we share or distribute a book to someone, we're not sure if they're going to open up the book, but we're seeing very clearly in Russia that it's not, a, it's not a hard task to open up the Bhagavad Gita and start reading from it. Yeah. Please share who's, who are we meeting next? Korzun? I'm sorry that I'm, I might be mispronouncing, so please help me. It's okay. Uh, Dina Korzun. Uh, she's a famous uh, actress in Russia, and she even won award, uh, Nika Award. It's uh, for uh, good actress work. It's a famous award in Russia for actresses. And um, she was, uh, she and her friend, Chupan Hamadova, it's also very famous actress in Russia. Uh, they are not only good in their job as actresses, but they have a very deep uh, heart and very uh, caring nature and they established a, a fund uh, charity fund for the uh, people who who got cancer and they um, saved many many people all over the country so they are very determined and uh, very um, uh, compassionate ladies and she's very intellectual she gives classes she tell about Bhagavad Gita on her Instagram page and she is very and uh, nice personality. Let's take a look. Здравствуйте. Меня зовут Дина Корзу. Бхагавад Гита мне была подарена случайно, не случайно на улице одной девушкой. И Бхагавадгит простояла у меня на полке 25 лет. Но и когда я ее открыла, я поняла, что это сокровищница. Передо мной раскрылся целый мир. Книга, которая рассказывает о Вселенной, о человеке, о месте человека в этом мире. Это глубокое философское послание. Это книга, которую непременно нужно прочесть каждому человеку, каждому интеллигентному, образованному человеку современному, молодому человеку. Я не удивилась, когда увидела Бхагавад Гиту номер один в списке литературы, которую советовал замечательный поэт Иосиф Бродский своим студентам, которые учились у него на поэтическом факультете в Американском университете. Так вот, Бхагавад Гита была номер один. И уже потом следовали древние греческие авторы, и древние римские, Вергилий, Данте и так далее. Кант, Бхагавад Гита номер один. Почему? А потому что это основа, 
основа восприятия мира. Все культурные люди, особенно 20 века, знали эту книгу. Она была настольной книгой Льва Николаевича Толстого. Особый перевод Бхагавадгиты был на столе у нашего императора Николая II. Я совсем недавно обнаружила удивительный перевод с армянского Анны Андреевны Ахматовой, где была такая строка «Ты вселенную держишь как бусу». И я сразу узнала, конечно же, это относится к строке из Бхагавадгиты, где сам Всевышний Кришна говорит о том, что Он держит Вселенную, все материальное мироздание своим сознанием, своей любовью. То есть весь мир покоится на нем, как перламутровые бусины на ниточке ожерелья. Поэтому, друзья, читайте Бхагавадгиту и будьте счастливы. Поздравляю вас с днем рождения этой величайшей волшебной книги. Well, I think we can all agree, all the viewers that are watching on YouTube and on Facebook, that uh, we have been blown away by the amazing, amazing talent that has come from Russia and how beautifully you have weaved the essence of the Bhagavad Gita and the teachings of the Bhagavad Gita in every way, shape and form and all your talents. So I know that we're going to end off with um, going back to a million voices where we started off again, and then I'll have a chance to um, appreciate both Ranga Naiki and Ranga Priya, and we'll head off to Africa. So let's take a look. In the, in the behind the scenes, we have been rocking to that million voices. And I am going to look up all these famous devotees uh, and uh, diversify my Spotify for sure with all these wonderful voices. So a huge thank you to Ranga Naiki, Ranga Priya and Maria for putting on this incredible show, despite so many difficulties um, as we, whether it's COVID, whether it's just getting everything together. And a huge thank you to all the translators that have helped out too. So thank you to Alina, Yuva Das, Nilachal, Praneshri, and Madhva Murari. It's not easy, um, you know, taking, first of all, uh, taking a video of this talent and then having to go through the whole thing and translate it uh, into English so that everybody can enjoy. So thank you to you both and your whole entire team for putting on such a wonderful show here in Russia. Thank you so much. Happy, we were very happy to be with you and share with this talents of Russian devotees. Thank you so much. Thank uh, you. We hope to, yeah, we hope to see you when you're when you're actually traveling. So please come to Canada. We would enjoy having you. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> Thank you. So, <laughs> so we're now off to, uh, we went from cold Russia now to the tropical continent of uh, the entire Africa. And we're very excited to um, introduce both uh, Tirumala Devi Dasi and Deva Madhava Das, who, had, who we had the pleasure of seeing yesterday. So welcome, welcome. Howdy, howdy. <laughs> Happy to be howdy, back. Howdy. So both Tirumala and, and Devamadva are 
um, esteemed devotees in their own respect, but I'll give it, I'll leave it to both of them to introduce themselves. I will see everyone later on uh, for, I believe, I forget, but I, oh, I'll be back for Latin America with, um, uh, uh, with Prema Prabhu and uh, we'll end off the day with North America with Deva Madhva Prabhu. So I'm very excited. Please enjoy your time in Africa. Um, Tiramala and her whole entire team have put in so much effort and I know you'll get a chance to see it. Hare Krishna. Hari Hari. Thank Hi, you, Rudy. I'm so excited to be here today. Nice to meet you, Tiramala. Glad to be nice here with you too. also. I have to first apologize for not being Russian because <laughs> after watching the presentations from that country, I was just so moved. Uh, Srila <laughs> Prabhupada really wanted that the culture of the Bhagavad Gita be something that the, the upper crust, so to speak, of society take up because as Krishna tells Arjuna in the third chapter, Whatever great people do, then common people will naturally follow. And so if they, they follow this Bhagavad Gita, then it'll be good for everyone. And you can see that's really happening in Russia. You can see that people from the, the kind of upper crust of the society are taking it to heart and others are following. So I was very moved by that sharing. I agree. I must be honest. It was just so moving to see how individuals use their talents just to be able to express themselves in so many different ways, just appreciating the Bhagavad Gita and honoring it. I think it was, the Russian program was just amazing. Okay, wonderful. How about you take us into Africa now, Tiramala? Tell us what we're going to be seeing today. So the African program is actually, um, it's a cinematic production. And mm. it comprises of reflections on the Bhagavad Gita presented by a diverse group of individuals. Um, there were about 30 individuals in total from various countries across Africa. And um, each of them, you know, put together a little piece, which we'll see in a minute. Um, you know, personally, I must say that I'd like to just reflect a little bit about this production. I can't help but say that, you know, each individual has come together and, um, you know, contributed to you know, this overall piece that honors the deeply profound message of the Bhagavad Gita. And it's like, it's like, you know, like a beautiful garland. And with, you know, which just wouldn't be the same if um, any of the flowers on that thread were missing. Mm. And um, as Vaisheshika Prabhu says, um, teamwork makes dreams work. And Jack. how we do is more important than what we do. Mm. So I hope everyone is ready to go on a journey with us through the Bhagavad Gita. I'm excited now. Let's see. personality of Godhead, Lord Sri Krishna said, I instructed this imperishable science of yoga to the sun god, Vivashvan, and Vivashvan instructed it to Manu, the father of mankind, and Manu in turn instructed it to Ikshvaku. This supreme science was thus received through the chain of disciplic succession and the saintly kings understood it in that way. But in course of time, the succession was broken and therefore the science as it is appears to be lost. That very ancient science of the relationship with the Supreme is today told by me to you because you are my devotee as well as my friend and can therefore understand the transcendental mystery of this science.
The first six chapters have been classified as the Karma Yoga section as they mainly deal with the science of self-realization through actions. This section describes the living entity as a non-material, eternal spirit soul capable of elevating himself to self-realization by different types of yoga, the highest form of which is Krishna Consciousness or Bhakti Yoga as confirmed by the final verse of the sixth chapter. Chapter 4 specifically deals with the transcendental position of Krishna as the Supreme Personality of Godhead and with the importance of Guru and disciplic succession. Since Krishna's instructions actually begin in the second chapter, chapter 1 serves as a prelude to the rest of the text. Chapter 2 is a synopsis of the whole subject matter of the Gita. Chapter 1 Observing the Armies on the Battlefield of Kurukshetra What follows in the next three minutes are some of my reflections on Chapter 1 of Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita opens in dramatic fashion with two armies poised for battle. Undoubtedly, this was the largest of all world wars in recorded history. Imagine 640 million soldiers with hundreds of thousands of horses, elephants, chariots, all assembled at one location with all the concomitant arrangements for food, shelter, repairs to equipment and medical attention for both man and beast for 18 days and then one begins to get a grasp of the scale of this fratricidal war. Brothers killing each other over wealth and property is the plot. Chapter 1 is entitled Observing the Armies on the Battlefield of Kurukshetra. The blind king and villain of the piece is Dhritarashtra, whose name literally means one who usurps the land of another. His eldest son is Duryodhan, and his name means Dirty Fighter. On the one side, we have these, uh, uh, the sons of Dhritarashtra, and on the other, we have the five virtuous Pandava brothers, who are willing to give up their lives for the sake of righteousness, with Krishna in their midst. Bhagavad Gita teaches that wherever there is Krishna, victory and all success is assured. The most complete glorification of Bhagavad Gita is found within the purport of the very first verse. His divine grace reveals that Bhagavad Gita is the essence of all Vedic literatures because in it is everything that is in every other scripture. In addition, it contains information that is not found anywhere else. Bhagavad Gita is therefore considered to be the topmost of all scriptures. After observing the armies, Arjuna laments and decides that he no longer wishes to partake in this ghastly warfare. Chapter 1 sets the scene for Lord Krishna to address the root cause of lamentation. Bhagavad Gita reveals who is God, who are we, where are we, why are we here and how to become perfectly happy. Bhagavad means God and Gita means song. Bhagavad Gita is the song of God intended for all people of all time and relevant to at every location within the cosmos. Blessed are those who hear Krishna's words exactly as he has spoken it and intended its meaning to be. Chapter 2 Contents of the Gita Summarized we are spirit souls having an embodied experience, a human experience. Sometimes in the course of our spiritual practice, we may be tempted to minimize these human experiences. Yet these same experiences can play an instrumental part as tests and lessons which help to shape and build our understanding and access to spiritual truths and to our original intrinsic identity. These tests and lessons are more often than not quite hard. These can be hard lessons of sorrow, hard tests of duty and responsibility, hard lessons of grief. 
The second chapter of the Bhagavad Gita can provide some insights on how to approach and overcome these tests through both analytical study and friendly guidance and counsel. This was the case of Arjuna, who was facing a plethora of tests on the battle of Kurukshetra. The Lord, as his dear most friend and chariot driver, patiently listened to him throughout the first chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, and in the second chapter he began to respond to Arjuna. But before this transcendental transmission can take place, it requires one to take a place of submission, of humility, receptivity and surrender, a willingness to take guidance, as Arjuna exemplifies for us in text 7 of the chapter. And so, by leaning in with the same mood of submission, we too can be guided on how to approach our many battles on our personal trajectories of earthly existence. The Lord first speaks in text 11 of the second chapter. His words to Arjuna are initially admonishing, yet the text describes that he delivers these words to his devotee with a smile. One takeaway from this can be the spirit of compassion, of how important it is that we extend compassion to ourselves as well as to others when we're battling with the wars of the mind and struggling with the six enemies. Arjuna does not deny or bypass his doubts, but rather he confides in a friend who can hold space for him, yet still hold him accountable to these eternal truths. And so the Lord, in the spirit of compassion and love for his friend, and by extension to us Jeevas in the material world, he weaves a tapestry of different topics in the second chapter, which are way too many for me to try to cover in this short. Yet in essence, his teachings and instructions on attaining our divine consciousness offer not only a soothing balm for our material ailments, but the Lord's words, the Lord's divine song performs an incisive surgery, a spiritual surgery for our material woes, for our material distress. As we approach the end of 2021, we are also encountered by how long the past two years have been and how in so many different ways we have been confronted by the many different layers of grief that this human experience is unfolded by. In my own continued pursuit of healing, I am time and time again guided by these different themes from the second chapter. I am satiated by Lord Krishna's response to grief-stricken Arjuna which offers solace and perennial timeless guidance to our own grief-stricken existence on this material plane. As we celebrate Gita Jayanti, we celebrate this eternal divine song of the Lord's, which heals our material complexes in so many deep and rich ways. And we celebrate and deeply honor His divine grace, Shila Prabhupada, who has so kindly granted us access to the spiritual healing. Chapter 3, Karma Yoga So chapter 3 starts with Arjuna asking Krishna, why do I need to engage in this battle? So as we know from chapter 2, Arjuna had some doubts because he had to kill some of his uh, mentors and family members in the battle. So Krishna responds in chapter 3 to this question and says, uh, Arjuna, you can't be inactive. You have to do some work. And Krishna explains how we are all under the influence of different modes of material nature and so on and so forth and so we have various duties and so he's encouraging Arjuna to fight but to offer that work to him so uh, karma yoga means that we connect with God through our activities through our prescribed duties and uh, through our actions so how do we do that we offer the result to God and in our lives we have our occupational duties and, and so on and so forth and when we do our work it might seem that we are seem we are doing uh, mundane activities but as a devotee aspiring devotee as someone who is practicing Krishna consciousness we can then offer that result of that same work that someone else might be doing the same work but we can then offer that result to Krishna what does that mean um, the result generally in practical terms we, we might be talking about money how do we offer that money to God well there's many many ways we can engage in the mission of the Lord in some way supporting that we can offer, turn our temples into our homes into a temple um, even a simple thing like food uh, we use our money to cook and we need to eat and so then we can make an offering of that food a loving offering 
and offer that to the Lord. And uh, Krishna explains in this third chapter that if we do not do that, we will eat only sin, actually. So it's a very, very practical chapter. And uh, it's really a nice point that we might be doing some work and it seems like it's mundane. But if we can connect with the Lord through offering the results of those activities, then our whole lives can also be part of our yoga practice in that way. Uh, some of my favorite parts of this chapter, are, um, one is the verse Yajyad Acharya Shrestas, where Krishna says, um, whatever actions a great man performs, um, the common man will follow. And whatever standards he sets by his exemplary acts, the whole world uh, will pursue. So uh, there's another nice point in, the, in this third chapter where uh, Krishna says, um, it's better to do your own duty imperfectly than to do someone else's duty perfectly. It's also very nice. And, and Krishna, as he does in various places in the Bhagavad Gita, he talks about himself. Uh, so, so in the third chapter here, he says that he has no uh, work in this material world and he has nothing to attain. But still, he performs a prescribed duties to set a good example. Chapter 4 Transcendental Knowledge I have come to deliver you. I have come to I have come as the as the message was broken, thus I will have to repeat it again. Bhagavad Gita Chapter 4 The Transcendental Knowledge Transcendental Knowledge is delivered through the disciplic succession. The teaching of Gita was done for the saintly king since they were to execute for its purpose in ruling the citizens. Once the chain of disciplic succession was broken, here there arose the need to re-establish it. Sri Krishna declares in terms of seven in to deliver the pious and to annihilate the miscreants as well as to re-establish the principles of religion, I myself appear millennium after millennium. Arjuna was suitable candidate for receiving this knowledge because he was a devotee of Lord Krishna. One who knows the transcendental nature of my appearance and activities does not upon taking leave, does not upon leaving the body take his birth again in this material world, but attains my eternal birth. Just try to learn the truth by preaching the spiritual master. Inquire from him submissively and render service to him. The self relaxed, the self realized soul will impart knowledge and truth to the A bona fide spiritual master who is in the line of the disciplic succession can convey the message of the Lord as it is to his disciple, which means a guru can engage his disciple in the devotional service to the Supreme Lord. The result of obtaining this knowledge is realizing everyone as part and parcels of the Lord. The Lord is a creator when everything, everything is sustained by him and after annihilation and after annihilation and after annihilation everything rests in him. Ignorance is the cause of all bondage and knowledge is the cause of all liberation. When one is in complete knowledge, proper understanding of one's constitutional position to relationship to Krishna will immediately will immediately turn to ashes or reaction in material activities. This faith is attained by the discharge of devotional service and by chanting and by chanting which cleans one's heart of all material dust. But Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare. But ignorant and faithless, faithless, 
person who doubts the evil scriptures and do not attain God's consciousness, thus they fall down. Arjuna is advised to slash his ignorance in his heart through the weapon of uh, transcendental knowledge. Chapter 5 Karma Yoga Action in Krishna Consciousness I'd like to share with you a few personal reflections on how the fifth chapter of Bhagavad Gita as it is has profoundly changed my life and is empowering me as I navigate in my current journey. I was actually thinking the other day about the fact that as I get older I seem to be tasked with a lot more responsibility. I've just come out of university. I've started my first job within the industry that I'm qualified for. Um, I've moved out of home, living on my own, and um, also navigating life as a devotee, working on my sadhana, um, taking on seva within you know, my immediate community and the greater ISKCON community. And my meditation has been, you know, Krishna, I'm not exactly sure how I'm going to manage all of this, how I'm going to balance it, you know, juggling these different parts of myself. Almost as if I felt like they should be detached from one another and not working in conjunction with each other. But Krishna has his way and he always arranges things perfectly. And so it was at a Bhakti Shastri class when we were doing the fifth chapter when um, I had to memorize the specific verse in the fifth chapter and it answered every single question that I had had when it comes to balancing my life. And really, you know, the solution is simple to offer all the results of my work and action to Krishna and put Krishna consciousness in everything. And so I've been doing this little thing for the last couple of months where I've branded myself a chapter five bhakti, um, where I try to remember Krishna in everything that I do. And um, that my constant prayer is Krishna, I have nothing to give you but myself. You know, you are the maker of all things. You are the ability in man. Um, and therefore, nothing I give you is new to you. But please accept it as an offering, as a sincere offering from me. And uh, give me the mercy and, and grant me the ability to do more for you, to do more for your devotees, to do more for the world. And so just in short, before I end off the video, I'd like to share that chapter um, and specifically one little thing in the purport that um, is my daily meditation when it comes to action and Krishna consciousness and making everything that I do a Krishna conscious service and a Krishna conscious journey um, as an offering to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And so I'd like to read in conclusion that specific verse, which is the last text of the fifth chapter, text 29. A person in full consciousness of me, knowing me to be the ultimate beneficiary of all sacrifices and austerities, the supreme lord of all planets and demigods, and the benefactor and well-wisher of all living entities, attains peace from the pangs of material miseries. And Prabhupada shares in the purport that the greatest peace formula is simply this, Lord Krishna is the beneficiary in all human activities. Men should offer everything to the transcendental service of the Lord because he is the proprietor of all planets and the demigods thereon. No one is greater than he. Chapter 6 Dhyana Yoga Bhagavad Gita is the song of Krishna, the song of God. Krishna spoke this Gita 5,000 years ago to his devotee and friend Arjuna. 
but it is purposely meant for the upliftment of humanity. There are 18 chapters in this book, the Bhagavad Gita. It says a philosophical treatise, and chapter 6 of Bhagavad Gita deals with the mind and mind control. Mind is the master of the senses. Everybody has a mind. In fact, just as we eat to live, we breathe to live, we also think to live. We cannot do without eating, we cannot do without breathing. Similarly, we cannot do without thinking. Everybody is a servant of his mind. The mind dictates to the senses and the senses carry the body to different destinations. The mind is said to be the director of the five senses and the mind is so influential in this life. So if the mind is not controlled, the mind makes life very miserable. And Krishna says, one must endeavor to, to, to control the mind. One must endeavor to uplift himself by controlling the mind. That one should, should upgrade himself, one should uplift himself with the mind. One should not allow the mind to degrade him. He says for the conditioned soul, the mind is the friend and the same mind is his enemy as well. For one who has controlled the mind, the mind is the best of friends. And for one who has not controlled the mind, the mind is the worst of enemies. So mind control is very relevant for every being in this world. Because everyone deals with the mind. We cannot run away from the mind. The mind is active during the day, directing the senses, and the mind is also active during the night when it is engaged in dreams. So day and night, the mind is influencing us. So if the mind is controlled, if the mind is purified, if the mind is engaged in the service of the Lord, then such a mind is a friend, and such a mind will give us happiness, such a mind will give us peace. But on the contrary, if such a mind, if the mind is not controlled, if the mind is not purified, then one will live in hell even though he is in heaven. Actually it is said, an uncontrolled mind creates hellish situations and a controlled mind creates heavenly situations. And we request everyone to make an endeavor to control the mind by chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. That was such a beautiful series of presentations. It was reminding me of one of my personal favorite verses. Um, Krishna says in the 10th chapter, Bodhayantas Parasparam, Tusyanti cha Ramanti cha, that the thing everyone's looking for, Tusyanti, satisfaction, and Ramanti, happiness, that comes from the devotees sharing their realizations. Prabhupada even uses in the translation, preaching to one another. <laughs> so it was very sweet to hear the devotees reflections on the different chapters and, and getting the specific essence of each chapter in their life. I was, I was feeling very uplifted by those realizations. I'd also just like to mention, um, you know, that um, in this particular segment, um, we had devotees from South Africa, Kenya, and Ghana participating. Mm -hmm. So it was a nice um, offering from different parts of Africa. How does it work that the different devotees are speaking on different chapters? Did they choose the chapters or did you guys yeah. choose the chapters for them? Mm -hmm. How did that work? Um, so we, we gave everybody an opportunity to choose which mm. chapter they'd like to, to speak on. Nice. Um, yeah. I don't know if you have any specific reflections. Um, I mean, I know you've shared that beautiful verse. There's one thing that I wanted to mention um, just with regards to chapter one. Mm. Um, which I actually, that I found that overview to be so profound by Jagana, Jagadananda Pandit Prabhu. And um, the way that he painted, you know, the scene of the battlefield, it was just mm. really beautiful. And um, 
you know, he mentioned that um, the Bhagavad Gita is meant for all people of all time. And I really appreciated this because it made me think about how the Bhagavad Gita is so timeless and its message can be applied to every situation. And, um, and then Bontley in the next chapter, chapter two, she mentioned, and I really like the way that she described it. She said that, um, you know, she described our personal challenges as being our personal kurikshetras of our mm. existence. And I just found that to be really beautiful. And mm. um, yeah, and it also makes me think that, you know, there's, you know, there's um, so much of effort and so much of dedication that's going into the translation of this literature into, you know, various languages across the, the world. And um, particularly in Africa, the Bhagavad Gita, as it is, has been translated into Igbo, it's been translated into Creole and Zulu. And um, all of these are now in the production pipeline of BBT mm. Africa. Um, yeah. And there's also um, the introduction to Bhagavad Gita was translated and published in America. And um, the rest of the Bhagavad Gita is now being translated into America. Yeah. Wonderful news. That's one of the efforts uh, highlighted during World Gita Day is seeing what work we have left to do <laughs> in being able to make this Bhagavad Gita accessible to the world in truth. And that certainly is linked with languages. And Africa is known for having so many different languages. And some of them are, are obscure in one sense. Only a few thousand, a few hundred thousand people may speak them, very rare dialects. And it's very moving to think that the devotees are in some sense toiling away <laughs> and finding more and more and more and more languages, which no one else will ever care to know uh, even um, or think to know the book was published in. But for those few souls who do contact it, it literally means everything. <laughs> so it's, it's very noble work to hear that is happening. Thank you for that update. Um, myself, I was just thinking about the relationship to work in this um, first six chapters. It seems like you all have kind of grouped the Bhagavad Gita into the classic 666 uh, formula where you have karma yoga and then the next six chapters are kind of like in, in America we have this um, cookie called an Oreo and the best part of the Oreo is the middle it's got the that's where the frosting is <laughs> the cream filling so the two cookies on the outside sandwich this nice frosting in the middle and these middle six chapters are where Krishna really reveals his own heart and invites Arjuna into that deeper relationship with him and um, as we heard from in the very beginning, this is a conversation between friends, Krishna and Arjuna are friends. And, and this next section is where their love really comes out, their affection for each other. So I'm looking forward uh, to hearing um, the reflections from the devotees in this particular section. This piece of the Oreo, the cream section, yeah. is put together by devotees in South Africa and Ethiopia. Wonderful. I'm looking forward to it. The middle six chapters have been defined as the Bhakti Yoga section, as they principally pertain to the science of the individual consciousness attaining self-realization through devotional service. In this section, the Supreme Personality of Godhead and his different energies and opulences are described. This section especially deals with the relationship between the Supreme Soul and the individual soul in regards to devotional service. Krishna also discusses the nature and activities of such pure devotional service, which he confirms to be the best process of self-realization. Chapter 7 Knowledge of the Absolute Chapter 7 is the doorway or the entry into the middle six chapters of Bhagavad Gita, which is the heart of the Bhagavad Gita. To this point, we've seen why Bhagavad Gita is a work of philosophical and spiritual genius. With each verse, we can appreciate the deep theological depth in Krishna's words. Now the whole chapter, chapter 7, which has got 30 verses, only Krishna is speaking these verses. Krishna wants to give knowledge of the Supreme. And that's the heading of the chapter, Knowledge of the Supreme. The knowledge generates faith. In a way, Krishna will present an abbreviated CV about himself. 
that he is the active essence of everything, he is a source of matter and spirit, that he is the essential ingredient. In essence, he is everything. Krishna says, but Arjuna, this knowledge is very rare. Thousands of people who toil for perfection and amongst those who actually achieve it, hardly one knows me in truth. But Arjuna, I'm going to tell you about myself. You will know me fully. When you know me, there's nothing else that remains to be known. So how beautiful is that? In essence, Krishna is saying, and he does say that everything rests upon me, Arjuna, like pearls are strung on a thread. Krishna even says that he's the controller of the different modes of nature. These modes of nature are like ropes, they bind one. Uh, Krishna is saying, Arjuna, I can untie you. Trust me, surrender unto me. Uh, through devotional service, you'll cross over this uh, illusion that um, an old age, illusion and old age, because old age is the mascot for death. So if you want to liberate yourself from death, an illusion, surrender unto me Arjuna, perform devotional service. So Krishna also refers to Bhumi, Apollo, Anulo, Vayu, his eight material elements where he talks about the material and the spiritual. And he, 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 he makes the point that Arjuna also have a superior nature, a spiritual nature. That's you Arjuna, the Jiva, the soul, which animates this world. Uh, there Krishna says that I am the taste of water, I am the light in the moon and in the sun, I am the sacred sound Om in the Vedas, uh, I am the sound in space, the valor in man, the austerity in the austere, uh, the fragrance of the earth, the perennial seed of all beings and the reason of the rational and splendor of the splendid. So this is a very beautiful chapter. It gives us a very good perspective. Krishna gives us a perspective of his divinity. Chapter 8 Attaining the Supreme The eighth chapter of the Gita begins with Arjuna posing different questions to Lord Krishna. He's trying to understand some, some terms that are mentioned at the end of the seventh chapter. Uh, these include karma, the living entity, material nature, and the demigods, amongst others. Uh, Arjuna then poses a final question to Lord Krishna. He's seeking clarification on how one can remember Krishna at time of death through devotional service. Krishna goes on to answer the first seven questions quite succinctly, but then focuses in on the last question that was posed by Arjuna. He responds that whatever one remembers at the time of death, that state he shall attain, and therefore we should remember Krishna alone at the time of death in order to attain him. But how can one remember Krishna at the time of death? Well, through devotional service, of course. And some practical ways to render service are chanting the holy names of the Lord, accepting the remnants of foodstuff known as prasada, and reading and distributing transcendental literature. Krishna then speaks about how yogis can attain him through vigorous and various yogic practices. These, however, can prove to be quite difficult for normal people in this world. A greater emphasis is now placed on devotional service by Lord Krishna. He describes the material and spiritual worlds and the means or processes to attain these different worlds. He speaks about how when one leaves one's body under different conditions, we can attain different final destinations. But a devotee should not be bewildered by that because naturally by following Bhakti they will automatically attain Krishna directly and also automatically achieve the results of all the sacrifices, rituals and yogic practices that one is meant to observe. In conclusion, chapter 8 is the perfect segue into chapter 9 of the Gita which speaks about the most confidential knowledge. A great emphasis is placed on pure devotional service in this chapter as a means to achieve love for Krishna and remember him at the time of death. Chapter 9 The Most Confidential Knowledge So in this section, I'm about to summarize the ninth chapter of Bhagavad Gita. So you all know that the importance of the ninth chapter of Bhagavad Gita has been indicated by the title itself, 
in Sanskrit, this chapter is known as Raja Vidya Raja Guyam Yog, or the most confidential knowledge. So Sri Krishna started informing Arjuna by telling him that he's just about to disclose the king of all knowledge to him because he is dear to him, because he is a friend to him. Yeah. He went on to say, uh, Rajaguya Raja Vidyam Pavitram Paramutamam. He said, This knowledge I'm about to disclose to you is the king of all knowledge, the king of all secrets, the most pure, the most transcendental. And he went on to describe so many wonderful shlokas. And right towards the end, he spoke one of the most important shloka of Bhagavad Gita. Manmana Bhava Madhpakto Madhyaji Mamnamaskaru. He is saying that if you want to return to me, if you want to come back to Godhead, then you have to become my devotee. You have to always remember me. You have to worship me. You have to pay respects to me. So in that way, he spoke this most significant verse right in the middle of the Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita has 18 chapters. This was spoken right at the end of the ninth chapter. But then Krishna also emphasized the same point towards the end of the 18th chapter of Bhagavad Gita. In 1865, again he said, Manmana Bhava Madhbhakto Madhyaji Mamnamaskaru. And he also informed Arjuna, he is disclosing this most confidential knowledge to him because he is non envious to him. So in that way, Sri Krishna describes so many wonderful shlokas within this chapter. Uh, one of them is uh, Maya Dakshina Prakriti Suyati Sacharacharam. He is saying that this whole cosmic manifestation is working under my direction. But then when I come down to earth, fools deride me as ordinary human beings. Hmm? So he is saying that, Pita ham, yes, sajagato. I am the father of the universe. I am the maintainer. I am the sustainer. I am the ultimate ashaya, refuge. Just simply by offering me some water, some leaves, some fruit, I'll be very pleased. Patram Pushwam Palam Tegam. He is saying, Gat Karosi Atashnashi, whatever you do, do it for me. Satatam Kirtan Tumam Ethantas Jadar Davataha. He is saying, constantly chant my glories. And towards the end, he concluded by saying, Manmana Bhava Manpakto Matajimam Namaskaru. Always remember me and become my devotee. And that way he concluded this wonderful chapter. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Chapter 10 The Opulence of the Absolute Today we'll be discussing Chapter 10 of Srimad Bhagavad Gita which is entitled Opulence of the Absolute. It's personally my favorite chapter in Srimad Bhagavad Gita because as aspiring devotees our goal is to be Krishna conscious and this chapter gives us um, so many meditations that allow us to become more absorbed in always remembering Krishna and never forgetting Him. At the end of the ninth chapter, Krishna says, Manmana Bhavamad Bhakto. And so in this chapter, Krishna then gives us um, the meditations and remembrances that allow us to become fully absorbed. And whether these meditations focus on the opulence of the Lord, on the power of the Lord, on the beauty of the Lord, they all serve to increase our faith, increase our remembrance, and allow us to become more fixed in our practice of Krishna consciousness. So in this chapter, it's typically uh, considered in four sections. Um, in the first section, Krishna's unknowability is described. Um, and Krishna himself makes the point that the great sages and demigods cannot know him. Um, you know, only know him in part. What to speak of, you know, minute living entities like ourselves. Um, and Krishna says this to um, to increase our faith in, in Him, um, in His qualities, in His nature, um, and to allow us to become more fixed in you know, our remembrance of His name, form, qualities, activities, paraphernalia, etc. Um, and in, in doing this, um, to draw out that mood of love, to draw out that mood of service, to draw out that mood of devotion. Krishna also describes the qualities of one um, but the qualities required in which to seek the absolute truth, which is particularly important for us to reflect on in our path as sadhakas um, in Krishna consciousness. The next section is the Chatu Shloki Bhagavad Gita. Um, so the four verses which are the summary of Bhagavad Gita. So you take all the 700 verses and compress that to four. These verses from um, text 8 to text 11 represent that. In the first verse, um, the opulence and position of Krishna as a Supreme Personality and Godhead and source of all is described. 
earlier in the chapter krishna describes um, that you know he is unborn um, he is without beginning and he is loka maheshwar he is the master of all um, thereafter in the next in in text 10 or text 9 rather um, krishna describes the eagerness of the devotees um, to love and to serve him and that is a position that we all aspire to um, that through our practice of krishna consciousness we are gradually developing and from that gradual development will manifest spontaneous love and devotion and then in the last two verses um, of the chatur shloki bhagavad gita krishna describes how he reciprocates with that eagerness and love of his devotees uh, we recently just celebrated the month of kartik uh, which exemplifies this mood of love and we see that same mood of love and how that love um, krishna becomes bound by that love even in the bhagavad gita with his interactions with arjuna where he takes uh, the menial position of his chariot driver and through arjuna's love he's then directing krishna krishna take me here on the battlefield take me here thereafter krishna then um, or arjuna rather um, he then reiterates and authoritatively states the position of Krishna, not just from Arjuna's own reflection, but um, linking that very specifically to the parampara, to great personalities like Narada, Asita, Vyas. And Arjuna, for our benefit, then asks Krishna to explain some of these qualities. Um, both because you know for our benefit and Arjuna is relishing hearing these nectarian qualities from Krishna. So Krishna then makes the point that he'll describe some of the more prominent qualities because as we know Krishna's qualities are unlimited. Lord Balaram in the form of Ananta since the beginning of creation with his thousands of mouths is glorifying the qualities of Krishna and is continuing to this day. So Krishna cites some of these more prominent qualities um, and these are qualities that allow us to draw our remembrance to the lotus feet of the Lord. And these qualities are described in the context of nature, in the context of philosophical truth. So Krishna emphasizing in the first point that he is the super soul in all living entities. Um, in aspects of nature, where Krishna says, um, you know, he is the sun, he is the moon, our bodies of water, he is the ocean, which is the greatest body of water, Krishna relates it to different demigods, to different qualities, etc. Um, and Krishna concludes by saying all of this is but a spark of his splendor, that one, one fragment of the splendor pervades the entire universe and sustains the entire universe. So this is the glory, um, you know, a little bit of the glories of Sri Krishna. Chapter 11 The Universal Form Hi Krishna. So, Chapter 11 of the Bhagavad Gita, as it is by His Divine Grace, Srila A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, is entitled The Universal Form. It is the chapter of the big reveal when Lord Krishna, at the request of Arjun, reveals his most extraordinary universal form, establishing his identity. Srila Prabhupada explains that Arjun has full faith, but he makes this request for the skeptics out there who may doubt and underestimate the Lord. And he makes this request in a most submissive mood. And the Lord reciprocates by providing celestial eyesight to Arjun and revealing this effulgent, inexhaustive, unlimited form that contains everything, moving and non-moving. Srila Prabhupada explains that the Lord is not just presenting himself theoretically or philosophically now to be the Supreme, but as this actual, experiential, Vishwaru, universal form. The Lord presents himself as Vishwaru and then as all-devouring Kala in the form of universal time, the destroyer of the world. First, Arjun becomes stunned, he's struck with wonder, and at the same time, he becomes overwhelmed with fear. And then he prayerfully requests Krishna to graciously withdraw that vision and present himself in his original two-handed form. 
and Arjun becomes happy again to see Krishna in this human-like form that he desires. The Lord then explains that this beautiful human-like form is the original form of Godhead. Krishna says, My dear Arjun, this form of mine you are now seeing is very difficult to behold. Only by undivided devotional service can I be understood as I am standing before you and can thus be seen directly. Only in this way can you enter into the mysteries of my understanding. So although it's not possible to see the universal form of the Lord, it's even more difficult to understand the Supreme Lord as He is. But by the mercy of Srila Prabhupada, we have been introduced to this most attractive personal form of the Lord. In all our temples, all over the world, this is the form to which our devotion is transferred. This is the mercy of Sri Prabhupada, that he has revealed the absolute truth to us and is teaching us how to see and serve the Supreme Personality of Godhead in his most confidential form. Personally, this is the good fortune that Srila Prabhupada has created for us. Chapter 12 Devotional Service Today I'm just going to be speaking a bit about the, you know, chapter 12 of the Bhagavad Gita, Devotional Service. So growing up, I've always had a, a problem with this whole idea of God-fearing people, you know, that, that we usually find in some scriptures. And uh, when I first came into Krishna consciousness, the very first thing that uh, I was very attracted to was this whole idea of, you know, how we are God-loving people, which basically means that, you know, um, because of Bhakti Yoga, which means you know, connecting with God through devotional service, that um, we're basically developing love with the Supreme Lord uh, through devotional service. So that was very attractive, uh, attractive to me. And I've always liked this idea very much. So when we look at um, the Bhagavad Gita in chapter 11, the universal form, we also find that you know, after Krishna manifested the universal form to Arjuna, that Arjuna was very fearful. And we find that this fear, what it does is that uh, it, you know, it, um, how do I say, it makes the one not to be able to serve Krishna fully. You know, wherever there's a fear, then we don't have, you know, the propensity to serve because it does not, you know, they clash. Those two ideas clash. Wherever there's love, they can never be feared. So I like that very much. So in the 12th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna establishes a devotee as being the topmost. And uh, this is also very, very attractive that Krishna sees the devotee as even in being better than himself as God. So, uh, you know, the position of a pure devotee is very special, you know, um, you know in the Bhakti Yoga um, you know, society or the Bhakti Yoga uh, process. And uh, that's all the you know, twelfth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita talks about this very much. And uh, Krishna there talks about the different processes, and eventually comes to the point of uh, discussing what Bhakti Yoga is and how it's very, very uh, higher to all of these other processes because there, then the devotee is able to is able to connect with Krishna through love. So this is very attractive and you know, this is what Krishna is teaching in the Bhagavad Gita. Chapter 13 Wonderful. I appreciate how Tribhuvanath Prabhu there in the last segment and then also the devotee before him, they brought out the intimate nature of what Krishna is trying to explain to Arjuna. Sometimes the Bhagavad Gita is kind of pigeonholed as a book of philosophy, 
but it's first a conversation of love between friends, Krishna and Arjuna, and Krishna happens to be <laughs> the supreme person, but he's not interested in being the big, powerful, all-destroying God that Arjuna sees in the 11th chapter. As that devotee so nicely explained, she said, Krishna himself is interested in just being intimate with Arjuna and by extension also just being intimate with us in a bond of love. So it's very sweet how the devotees brought that out because that's really the, the core of what um, excites me when I think about that middle section of the Bhagavad Gita. And it's also very practical, you know, this whole process of devotional service. Um, and, um, you know, when we got to chapter, I think it was about chapter eight, um, Radha Rasa and Yavat were explaining, you know, the different forms of devotional service that um, we can engage in. Mm -hmm. And um, they mentioned, you know, reading and distributing transcendental knowledge. And, you know, this World Gita Day celebration in itself is actually part of the Live to Give campaign which is a global effort to distribute 2.2 million Bhagavad Gita's. Mm. And um, the purpose of this is, you know, to bring everybody together and, um, you know, celebrate the Bhagavad Gita and its impact globally. And, you know, the names that you can see at the bottom of the screen are actually, um, those names that are scrolling across are actually the names of the individuals that are participating in this campaign and, you know, making that sacrifice to make this literature available to as many individuals as possible and so I actually just wanted to mention that and um, you know just have you know a moment to appreciate them for all of their efforts. Wonderful thank you for bringing that out we um, saw at the beginning in Australia this beautiful series of paintings by a devotee named Bhakta Das and then also in Russia we saw some more painting uh, of Krishna's form. And then in the beginning of this presentation, somebody was mentioning about the um, harmony and the Bhagavad Gita. And in the paintings that Bhaktadas did, he used a very particular kind of art form or style, um, which just uses little dots where we call them pixels now. So pixelation, but it was started by a Frenchman a couple, a uh, hundred years ago or so, 150 years ago, um, named um, Surat, as it goes, it's a kind of a Sanskrit name, <laughs> and the means good taste. And the this pixelation creates, if you the the artist is skillful enough, this deeply compelling image that's engrossing and at the same time made up of all these obviously small little pieces. Any painting is made up of many brushstrokes, but it's not always so obvious. And this um, particular style highlights just how many small movements and pieces go into making uh, a particular piece of artwork. And I think that's one of the messages of World Gita Day also. When we hear 2.2 million Bhagavad Gita's, uh, somebody might, well, I, I can't do that. <laughs> I can't distribute 2.2 million Bhagavad Gita's, but that's not what's being asked of us. What's being asked of us is just distribute two or three, 20 or 30, 200 or 300, whatever our capacity might be to do our little part, be it that little pixel on the page and in the hands of our spiritual masters, in the hands of Srila Prabhupada and our previous acharyas, in the hands of the Lord, then we can become a part of that beautiful painting and, and offering back to them, showing our appreciation of the love that they've given us. That was so beautiful. I actually must say I really appreciate that. Uh, thank, thank you, you for <laughs> reminding us of the, the true spirit of this Gita Day. And this presentation from Africa has been so, I mean, it's really good that Africa followed Russia because <laughs> Russia was going to be really hard to follow, but Africa is uh, setting the bar very high with these um, very cohesive and articulate and really compelling um, narrations of each individual chapter. I'm loving this. So I, I think it's a good time now. Let's get into the last section, which is going to be, we've, we've, now we're through the cream and we're back to the cookie, <laughs> but since it's a Krishna cookie, we still enjoy it. We still like that part. The last six chapters are famous as the kind of Gyan yoga section where Krishna wraps up some of the philosophical points that he's made to Arjuna and then concludes with a few famous verses in chapter 18, which I'm sure will be highlighted by the devotees. So this next um, section is put together by devotees in South Africa, Zimbabwe and Nigeria. Chai.
The final six chapters are regarded as the Jnana Yoga section, as they are primarily concerned with the cultivation of Jnana, or knowledge. In the third six chapters, how the living entity comes into contact with material nature, how he is entangled, and how he is delivered by the Supreme Lord through different methods of fruitive activities or karma, cultivation of knowledge or jnana, and devotional service or bhakti are all explained. The Gita is actually finished in 17 chapters. Chapter 18 is considered a summary of all previous instructions. Chapter 13 Nature, the Enjoyer, and Consciousness This chapter covers topics that have been discussed previously in the Bhagavad Gita, but from a more technical, analytical perspective. The chapter starts out with Arjuna asking Krishna to define six items. And these six items are Prakriti, which is nature, Purusha, the enjoyer, Kshetra, which is the field of activities, Kshetra Gya, the knower of the field, Gyanam, which is knowledge and the process of knowing, and Gyayam, the object of knowledge. Krishna begins by defining the field and the knower of the field. He explains that the body is known as the field and one who knows the body is called the knower of the field or the soul. And to understand um, the difference between the body and the soul, one can simply consider that from childhood to old age, the body undergoes several changes. Yet the person who owns the body remains the same. And this is known as the knower of the field, the soul residing within the body. Krishna then describes how the soul can disentangle himself from the body by cultivating jnana, which is knowledge. The method of acquiring this knowledge can be achieved through the cultivation of divine qualities. And then Krishna goes on to list these qualities. Now, true knowledge is not reflected by how much an individual can memorize or repeat. Rather, it is about character and it is reflected through one's behavior. Krishna then explains the purpose of this knowledge, which is actually to realize the relationship between the soul and the super soul. Mundane logic and material sense perception cannot be used to understand the super soul. And those who attempt to understand him in this way for, for them he remains unknowable. However, for those who approach the subject matter in a humble state of mind, with sincerity and through the eyes of teachers who have understood this knowledge, for them they can realize the super soul which is actually the object of all knowledge. The final two items that Krishna discusses a nature and the enjoyer. Now the conditioned soul has an innate um, desire to enjoy the material nature separately from the super soul. And this enjoying spirit is what binds the conditioned soul to the material world and to the body. So the super soul is the actual enjoyer and everything is meant for his enjoyment. To understand um, this, one can think about watering a tree. Now for the entire tree to be nourished, one wouldn't attempt to water each individual leaf or each branch one will water the root of the tree. 
So in the same way, um, when one satisfies the super soul for his enjoyment, all other living entities automatically become happy. So I will end by reading the last verse of this chapter, verse number 35. Those who see with eyes of knowledge the difference between the body and the knower of the body and can also understand the process of liberation from bondage in material nature attain to the supreme goal. Chapter 14 The Three Modes of Material Nature this Bhagavad Gita is absolutely powerful I mean, the commentary and the purports by Srila Prabhupada are just absolutely brilliant and it really resonates and hits home. Chapter 14 is where I am at today with you and chapter 14 is the three modes of material nature. These three modes, <laughs> oh my gosh, yo, <laughs> as we say in South Africa, yo, they're very powerful. They hold things down, they hold you down and they are influencing a lot of the things we do in this world while we are in this material world and you know goodness passion ignorance you know they have the characteristics in which you can identify them but i mean just so just tell you goodness is obviously good knowledge cleanliness purity that that that's kind of like one level we want to be on right is in a good good space you know but it's still influenced by the material by, this, by, the, by the material nature, which is these three modes of material nature against us. So Prabhupada also, you know, expresses clearly, you know, this conversation that Arjuna and Krishna are having. And, and he also then says, how does one transcend? Because that's probably the question you're like, okay, I'm in these three modes of material nature. These three modes of material nature have got me down. You know, how do I transcend it? And Arjuna's question as well is how do you transcend it? How do you identify people who have it? And then also what are the symptoms of behavior? So Prabhupada really well brings it together for us. And, and, I, and I, I just love this part is that we have to move from, I just love this part how he expresses it, is that you have to move from a consciousness, which is what we all have, to a Krishna consciousness environment. And Krishna consciousness environment, or Krishna consciousness consciousness, is, is really coming with surrender because this is the Supreme Lord and he himself says in the Bhagavad Gita is that this material nature is very powerful and it's very hard to overcome but the only way to overcome it is through surrender and he says that that's 714 so we have to come to this Krishna consciousness state and this Krishna consciousness state is devotional service it's a platform where we have surrendered ourselves to devotional service to the pleasure of the Supreme Personality of God and Having that done, one can experience freedom. And freedom is what we really want sometimes, you know. And real true freedom is when you're in that state, in a Krishna conscious state, not affected by the modes of material nature. You've identified that you these modes of material nature does exist and how they influence you. You're in this material world and our want is to go back on back to Godhead coming back to what I want is, is surrender consciousness to the Supreme Personality of God. Simple things that we do in our life, offering flowers to the Lord, smelling those flowers, chanting, hearing, seeing the Lord, engaging our senses in the Supreme Personality of God in service and pleasure, and surrendering that way. Chanting the Holy Name is probably the easiest and fastest way for us to, to move to through these three modes of material nature and transcend and go back on back to life. Chapter 15 The Yoga of the Supreme Person In this chapter we get to hear about the relationship between the Supreme Personality of Godhead the individual living entity also about what this material world is, what the spiritual world is. So the chapter begins with a very beautiful analogy, discussing this material world to be like a banyan tree. Banyan trees are famous for being 
very, very big. They can grow into kilometers in size. And this type of banyan tree is upside down, according to Krishna, that its roots are up, upwards and its branches and it gives certain types of fruits which give certain types of fruits that is explained that in this world the material world is like a perverted reflection of the spiritual world and this is where we are and as such everything is upside down here in that it is not in its proper position the original place is the spiritual world and the original happiness that we're looking for is found within that spiritual world but in this world we simply get the fruits of entanglement and they are bitter but Krishna gives hope that when one is freed from the dualities when one is purified in consciousness then they can surrender to that supreme person and then the result is that one is freed from this material world and one can go to the eternal world. And this eternal world is very different from this world. There, for illumination, there is no need for sun, moon, and stars, electricity, and fire. That means all the illumination actually comes from the bodily effulgence of the personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna. So it's an invitation to come there. Krishna then discusses that there is an eternal relationship between himself and the individual living beings. He calls us his Angsa. He says, Mama Vangsa Jiva Loke Jiva Bhuta Sanatana. Manasastani Indriyani Prakritistani Kashati. That eternally the living beings are my parts and parcels, but they are struggling in this conditioned world due to the six senses which include the mind. Pointing out at the problem, diagnosing the source of our struggle in this kashati stani. Stani means place, kashati, difficulty. So this material world is a place of difficulty. Krishna doesn't wish that we struggle as his eternal parts and parcel. We are like his children. Therefore, he directs us towards the spiritual world. And the Lord then discusses that without proper spiritual vision, without proper spiritual knowledge, one cannot see how this eternal living being is getting a body at birth, stays for some time, quits it and gets another body. That that vision is only available to those who have been illuminated with transcendental knowledge. They can understand how the living being is actually struggling in this world, being embodied in this temporary body and uh, struggling for happiness. So the Bhagavad Gita is directing us into a position of yoga, union with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Therefore then the Lord discusses how he is seated within the heart of all living beings. Savasya Chahamridi Sani Vista Mata Smriti Gyanama Poanamcha that I am giving from within the heart knowledge, remembrance, and forgetfulness. Then he says, Vedais Cha Savai Aham Eva Vedya Vedanta Krit Veda Ved Eva Chaham. I am the compiler of all the Vedas, I am the knower of all the Vedas, and by all the Vedas I am to be known. The goal of all Veda, Veda means knowledge. This Bhagavad Gita, which we are going to be celebrating during Gita Jayanti, the appearance of such Bhagavad Gita spoken by Krishna in, in the battlefield of Kurukshetra, Veda means knowledge. So all knowledge, by all knowledge, the goal of all knowledge is to know Krishna. It doesn't matter what knowledge one is culturing, if it does not lead one to understand the source of all knowledge, who is the compiler of all knowledge, Krishna, then that knowledge is as good as illusion because it doesn't reveal that personality who is our eternal friend and whom we find the greatest happiness in a 
a loving relationship. Chapter 16 The Divine and Demoniac Natures In the previous chapter 15, Lord Krishna explains that He, being the supreme spiritual whole, gives birth to us, the living entity, in this conditioned material world. And we are but His eternal fragmental parts. As such, the living entity shares the spiritual qualities or the qualities of the Supreme Lord that of Satchit Ananda, eternality, knowledge and bliss. Being a fragmental part of the Supreme Lord, the living entity has a duty to that Supreme Whole. In the, in the same way a leaf has a duty to the whole tree or a hand has a duty to the body. So the living entity has a duty to the Supreme Whole, that of service. As we understand, the living entity in this material world is engaged in service and engaged in such a service that they are looking for happiness and knowledge. Although they are doing so in a misguided way, they are looking for knowledge and happiness to please themselves rather than pleasing the Supreme Whole. And such a tendency is what is here explained as the demoniac tendency when the living entity being overtaken by false pride and false ego considers himself the doer considers himself the lord of material nature and being the lord of material nature assumes the rights and privileges of the supreme lord upon himself in such a deluded state the living entity suffers reactions to their actions and thus takes birth again and again in this material world uh, reaping so to speak the rewards of their previous actions so the supreme lord here is advising arjuna not to become overtaken by the demoniac tendency to think they themselves the lord over material nature but to surrender unto the actual world the supreme world and give him service for by doing so the living entity comes back into their constitutional position comes back into their full understanding of their identity that of being a servant that of being part and parcel of the complete whole and not separate and independent so the message of chapter 16 is ultimately that the living entity should know what their duty is and the only way to know what their duty is is to know what their identity is and the Bhagavad Gita as a whole is a treatise on re-establishing our eternal identity as the servants of Lord Sri Krishna the Supreme Home Chapter 17 The Divisions of Faith Chapter 17 describes the three modes of worship. Um, Krishna explains the three uh, modes of guna to um, Krishna, uh, Arjuna. Arjuna asked Krishna which guna prevails on men who um, worship with faith but reject um, scriptures. Krishna then explains these three gunas. That's the sattvic guna, the rajas guna, and then the tamasic guna. Now Krishna went further to explain in detail that the sattvic um, guna or men with sattvic nature worship gods for the sake of worship. They are able to control the body mind and do not have the, any desired outcome. They usually eat food in the mode of goodness, which is uh, fresh foods, um, juicy succulent that actually brings vitality to the body. These people give charity wholeheartedly without any um, um, expectations um, um, in terms of returns. Now, men with Raja's nature, Krishna explains that they worship demigods out of desire 
and for pride and to um, gain power to control and to harm or rule others. They usually eat food in the mode of passion, that is food that are salty, sour, bitter, and that brings discomfort to the body. They give charity um, disrespectfully and half-heartedly. And the last nature, that is the Thomasic nature, men in such uh, a mood, they worship dark spirits and ghosts. They usually eat food in the mode of ignorance, that is food that are still um, pungent, um, overcooked and contaminated. They, they give um, charity at the wrong time and at the wrong place. Now Krishna um, um, indicated that um, with all among these three um, modes of uh, uh, goodness, the sadhvi guna is the quality closest to divinity, and more importantly, because it has um, positive traits. However, since it is still part of material nature, it has the potential to hold one to repeated birth and death. Krishna teaches us that faith and yoga alone is not enough to liberate one from material suffering. Um, but understanding of the scripture is very, very important. He encouraged Arjuna to take action rather than um, inaction and um, warn him, you know, taking action against um, um, scripture or not in accordance to scripture. So when we act against scripture, irrespective of the faith with which we acted, um, it will not be considered right. And um, therefore we are encouraged to, as we take any action to chant Om Tat Sat, um, to uh, purify our um, satisfied actions and, and to become pure. Chapter 18 Conclusion The Perfection of Renunciation One of the main things that attracted me to Krishna consciousness was the practical aspect of devotional service. In text 5, Lord Krishna is explaining to us that we should never give up the activities of charity sacrifice and penance and in addition to this we need to make sure that none of these activities are completed for our own personal gain prior to becoming a devotee my grandmother Val was the first person that I knew who surrendered to this practice although not a devotee she was selfless in her giving. She was a wealthy person who sacrificed her needs for the needs of others. She gave freely with an open heart. And at the end of her life, when she was challenged by serious illness and suffering, she never once complained. One of the things that have stayed with me over that time was when we came to pack up her belongings everything that she owned at the end of her life fitted into one packet this in her example was an excellent example of renunciation everyday life presents us with many different challenges they can be relationship-based, financial, emotional, physical. Many times these challenges can create within our lives great levels of distress and fear. Over my years in Krishna consciousness, the greatest solace that I have found in the lonely and difficult times has come from text 65, where Lord Krishna says, Always think of me, become my devotee, worship me and offer homage unto me. Thus you will come to me without fail, 
I promise you this because you are my very dear friend. And when I am afraid for any reason, the ultimate instruction from the Lord is in text 66, where he says, Abandon all varieties of religion. Just surrender unto me. I shall deliver you from all sinful reactions. Do not fear. Hare Krishna. Always think of me, become my devotee, worship me, and offer your homage unto me. Thus, you will come to me without fail. I promise you this, because you are my very dear friend. go Africa. <laughs> that was beautiful. Uh, Tiramali, you were one of the devotees who was instrumental in putting all of that together. Any behind the scenes nectar you want to give us for the effort that was put in and the thought process behind it? Well, you know, it's, it's really a, a team effort. I mean, if you looked at the names, you know, scrolling on the screen at the end, there were so many devotees that contributed to this. And, you know, I just feel so appreciative and just so just so much of gratitude for everyone's sacrifice in making this happen because, you know, as I mentioned, when we started off, it's like a beautiful garland mm. without, with a single flower missing, you're not going to get that, that, that exact same beautiful um, piece. And I just feel like everybody throughout their, their difficulties and, you know, there was so much of sacrifice that went through in, in getting this together. And I'm just really grateful to everybody and all of the guidance that we had in, and all of the support. So, yeah. yeah. It's beautiful to see over the 18 chapters, such diverse people offering their reflections and realizations, you know, every size and shape of Jiva we could imagine, <laughs> younger, older, richer, poorer, everyone was there. And everyone was expressing their deep appreciation for what Krishna is giving Arjuna in the Gita. And that's 
one of the demonstrations that we can practically see with our own eyes of the transcendental nature of this information is that it really works for everybody anywhere, whether we're in Russia or Africa or North America or Australia. So really big thanks to the African team and yourself, especially to Ramallah for not only helping to organize it all, but then coming on and hosting it, making sure it would go smooth. And even I couldn't mess it up. It was so well put together. It was an absolute pleasure. And I'm so grateful to have had this opportunity. Chai, Beautiful chai. program. Thank you for your time with us. Uh, so I, I think now we're going to be bringing on Her Grace Ishvari. Are you with us, Ishvari? Hare Krishna. Hari Hari. Yes, Madhana. I am. Glad to meet you. My name is Deva Madhavadas. Hare Krishna. Nice to meet you. Where are you coming from? I'm in uh, Ottawa, Russell, to be exact. Russell. Okay, so neither of us are physically in Europe, but we're going we're going to do some Manasa Seva and go over <laughs> to the European continent and, yeah. and peruse the content that the devotees have created for us there to help celebrate World Gita Day. Uh, what do you do there in Ottawa, Ishwari? I um I think you know him well, but I work with Krishna Jalal Prabhu. I work oh. at his Montessori school. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's so. such a sweet project. That's yeah. Russell, right? Is the name of the little town? Russell, yeah. Yeah, I have a I have affection. I I spoke with Krishna Dulal Prabhu sometime last year, and I also serve in a, a relatively small place, Ypsilanti, Michigan. No one's ever heard of it. And probably no one will, but we have our little thing going on and we're mm -hmm. very satisfied and, and we feel like we can do something for Prabhupada. <clears throat> Thanks to the efforts like World Gita Day, where we all get to connect and uh, feel a part of the larger community. So I really appreciated hearing from Prabhu how you guys are also just a small group of devotees in a relatively anonymous place on the planet. But Mahaprabhu's movement is happening and, and thriving. You guys have a children's school and a couple yes. other beautiful projects there. Yes, yes. It's Jai. truly, amazing. yeah, Jai. <laughs> <laughs> Will yeah. you be um, co-hosting with me? That's, we're hosting right now. We're, we're, oh, okay. we're together, we're on, and uh, we're in Europe, believe it or not. And Jai. now we're going to, um, we can bring up our first presenter. His name is Divya Nam Prabhu, and he's going to do the introduction for the European Yatra. And Europe is um, a really, uh, of course, a very diverse place in itself. And so we're going to hear from many different countries within Europe today, but we'll turn it over to Divya Nam Prabhu first. Hare Krishna, Deva Madhav Prabhu, Ishwari yeah. Keshavi Mataji, Anakula Prabhu, Shamwini Mataji, and everybody else, and all our audiences from all around the world. Thank you for bringing the channel now down to Europe. Very grateful to be with all of you today. Um, so it's, it's a really a true honor and a privilege to be able to present Europe uh, to all of you, um, very briefly sharing with you um, a little bit of an impact which this wonderful literature Bhagavad Gita is making in Europe. Uh, before I do that, I also wanted to mention that with me is uh, a very dear friend, Raghavendra Prabhu, who's been very kindly helping us, assisting us and the global team in um, bringing the whole Europe together on this platform. So, um, I mean, I was just thinking about it today, um, that how this whole thing actually uh, so wonderfully started by the blessings of Srila Prabhupada. Yeah. And I was thinking that formerly literature like Sanskrit literature was not easily available, even in, in, in India, some well-to-do people, and there were some copies in, in, in homes where people were really able to afford it. And the books were more or less the treasure of the Brahmanas, as we hear from our literature from our Goswamis and often kept within the temple. However, coming from Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Thakur, Srila Prabhupada's spiritual master, he made it um, a very deliberate attempt to try and take these books and print them to, uh, in as many languages as possible. And he empowered AC Bhakti Vedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada, his divine grace Srila Prabhupada who then very carefully translated all the literatures, but very specifically the Bhagavad Gita. And uh, now people are increasingly having a lot of uh, trouble, as we see in the world, trying to relate with each other, try to connect with each other. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and where Europe stands, we are now going through our third wave of uh, this 
pandemic which is really becoming there is no endemic to it there's no end to it which <laughs> which in itself is 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 quite amazing but what has been very helpful is that shila prabhupad wanted all of us to be opportunist and that's what everybody is working around the globe especially in europe trying to spread this message of bhagavad gita wide and far so i was connecting with some devotees in france and there are attempts being made to really reach out to some senior people in france and really make the bhagavad gita uh, one of the famous books alongside many other literatures which may be there today in germany people are going uh, door to door street to street they have created special events around the world gita day inviting people just trying to share with them some knowledge of what bhagavad gita is how it's been recognized by various universities how this literature has read by the likes of mahatma gandhi albert einstein and more recently uh, we have seen some really amazing videos of some hollywood celebrities like one of them is will smith um, who who talks about this he's been reading this wonderful literature so we can see the impact is uh, is really profound um on 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 europe and many people are embracing it just the very fact that there are over nearly 12 or 13 countries participating in this effort from the europe is a testimony that how this bhagavad gita is actually making an impact so i'm extremely grateful mm-hmm. that we are able to collaborate to this wonderful platform uh and this wonderful day like the world gita day to be able to come together in in uk uh, especially there is a lot of attempt has been made uh, to not only print but profusely distribute this uh, literature so we had some really good success um, over the last uh, gita giant uh, the world gita day which we celebrated in uk just as we know and the whole world did on 14th we just a few devotees on a group came up with this idea that let's distribute 1008 bhagavad gitas and we started to put a name together like okay let's each do 10 and reach out to the people and it's amazing in a very short while we had about over 65 70 devotees came together and and we we surpassed that 1000 bhagavad gitas just in a day apart from what else was happening in the community so that goes to shows that devotees uh, and the followers of the bhagavad gita have this natural inclination to reach out uh, to as many as as many people as possible and share this transcendental knowledge uh, with the people so those were some of my comments um, uh, on around the side of the impact i think it will be nice uh, we will i have i've requested all the devotees uh, and the leaders in the europe to share some stories and experiences with us post this uh, end of the month uh, where they have had some people who have really their life have changed and has impacted one little story i want to end with which was shared with us recently by his grace sutapa prabhu who's been on streets over the last 20 uh, nearly 20 days now he uh, was hearing uh, a lecture by a wonderful uh, disciple of shila prabhupad his holiness tamal krishna maharaj where mm-hmm. maharaj was constantly talking about that when you want to serve spiritual master you have to serve it with one pointed determination hmm. and on many occasions in the talk maharaj kept bringing back to the same point and sutapa prabhu was contemplating and as he went out into the battlefield trying to share the bhagavad gita with everybody he met with a man who actually came up to sutapa prabhu and said oh wow that's bhagavad gita i've read bhagavad gita and sutapa prabhu said oh really have you read the whole thing and he said yes i've read the whole thing and the next thing sutapa prabhu asked him okay tell me your favorite verse and the person turned around and said ak kuru nandana and that was like sudapa prabhu said this is just the confirmation that we have to dedicate our life to the bhagavad gita and to the instructions of the spiritual master and that very story has become the highlight of us in the europe we've been sharing it talking about it and really trying to work hard on on popularizing this literature bhagavad gita here in europe so i'd like to conclude on that st- um, story from my side and hand it back to ishwari keshavi mata ji or or uh, deva mata prabhu thank you devi nam prabhu and to give you a little uh credit and let the devotees know whom they were hearing from you're one of the maharatis under the supreme general vaisheshika prabhu you're in charge of the whole european uh, book distribution team the the one world sankirtan team 
And just by judging the efforts that um, happened during the Budra campaign, where there was a certain goal set and that was smashed, <laughs> I'm excited to see what you guys are up to uh, for this Gita Day effort. That, that was a really sweet story about the thousand books or so that went out just because of a little WhatsApp messaging. <laughs> so thank you for all your efforts, Prabhu, and for sharing those realizations. Um, I think up next we have some devotees from Denmark, and particularly uh, one devotee named Vasant Prabhu, who's going to share with us some Sankirtan nectar. Uh, the Europeans, historically within ISKCON, might be the most famous of all the book distribution teams. They really, uh, in the 80s especially, re redefined what it meant to do big books. <laughs> so excited to hear from these devotees today. mistake that was not book distribution from Denmark <laughs> that was a beautiful dance by a young devotee named Rishni who's uh, a student at the Avanti schools in Europe and she's been studying dance since the age of four which we can see she's really brought into her heart and that was a, a dance depiction of Bhagavad Gita my apologies Rishni Ishwari have you done any of that kind of dance before Bharatanatyam and expressing Krishna Leela through dance Never, never. I, um, I have a background in theatrical performance, mm. uh, but have been very fond of the art of Bart Nacham. And I can recall a, a memory um, where Srila Prabhupada had encouraged, you know, whatever the art is, whether it's dance, whether it's drama, then one should use it for Krishna. So it was very inspiring to see Vrishni use her artistic talents in that way. Jai. Jai. Yeah, I, I was when I was watching the dance, sometimes militarists who are very good describe war as a dance. <laughs> That's ah. how they actually see it. You know, kshatriyas who, who love the battle, yes. they, they see it as a kind of dance, not this, this gruesome, difficult thing, but this beautiful, expressive thing. Uh, so it was nice to see Rishni bringing the Gita to us as a dance. So now I think we'll go to the book distribution <laughs> <laughs> um, team in Denmark. Book distribution actually is fun and easy. Easy, easy and easy. Yeah. Hare Krishna, my name is Mahabharat Das. Hare Krishna, my name is Vasanta Das. I am from Ukraine and I came to Danio three years ago. Ja, fra Danmark af. Jeg har i Danmark de sidste tre år. This December, devotees of ISKCON set a goal to distribute 2.2 million Bhagavad Gita's all around the world. 
So our Danish Yatra decided to pledge 1,008 Bhagavad Gita's. We have never before tried to distribute books going from door to door, but we decided why not to try? The interesting thing about spiritual knowledge is that the more you give, the more you get. We are going mostly to student apartments and we found that most of them are interested and actually they are taking the books. So first day we distributed 5 books, the second day 15 books and the third day 22 books. We found that it's really important not just to distribute books but actually to connect to the people, take their phone numbers, visit them, call them. We hope everyone gets a chance to experience this bliss. Oh, sweet, some ingenuity from the young men. Bye. Yeah, what inspiring words from such dedicated Sankirtan devotees. And uh, what stood out for me is when he said, why not try? Mm. I, think, I think the mantra this year given by, by Shisheka Baru is uh, assume it can be done, just encouraging mm. everyone to make an attempt. And it looked like they were having fun, so... Totally. I was feeling a little ashamed because clearly they're in a cold climate. <laughs> they weren't out in shorts and t-shirts. So I was thinking to myself, yeah, I've got no excuse. <laughs> <laughs> Same. Uh, next, we'll be hearing from His Grace Bhuta Bhavana Das, who oh, is great. a disciple of His Holiness Bhakti Tirta Swami. And he's a prolific speaker and preacher and mentor and a big part of the UK congregation. So, uh, We'll be hearing from him and uh, yeah, hearing him share some motivational wisdom with us about the Gita. It's one of the greatest gifts to humankind. And it's a great gift to humankind for a number of reasons. One of the greatest needs of human society is wisdom. There's constantly an emphasis on research, understanding, insight. Why? Because we want to understand the reality that we live in so that we can navigate that reality in a healthy way. One of the greatest gifts I've received from the Bhagavad Gita is the gift of understanding. In the um, Bhagavad Gita, there are certain lessons which are repeated. One of the lessons which are repeated by Krishna in this wonderful dialogue between him and the warrior Arjun is the repetition of the need to live according to our nature. There's a huge industry in the world now which is all around purpose. People looking for their purpose. But the Bhagavad Gita addressed this over 5,000 years ago when Arjuna in his conversation with Krishna learned that it is better to perform his own duty as a warrior than to try to be something that he is not. And it's a very, very wonderful lesson. I often think about this in terms of leadership development, in terms of community, in terms of productivity, how powerful, how much more successful and how much more enthusiastic everyone would be if we were able to take the time to understand what are the gifts, what are the talents that I've been born with, which I can then invest in and develop. And then also, 
it brings about a deeper understanding about the about the formula for happiness. The Bhagavad Gita, one of its greatest gifts, is that in order to be happy, there are two formulas that we need to follow. One is the formula of how we live in this world, doing our worldly duty, but also a deeper formula. The formula of understanding that because my nature is spiritual, if I do not bring that spiritual dimension into my life, if I do not give that spiritual nourishment in my life through spiritual practices, then no matter what I do in the worldly sense, I'll always feel empty in the inner sense. So for me, those two lessons of the Bhagavad Gita are crucial. Who am I in the worldly sense? What are my talents and capabilities that I can offer to society? And who am I in the deepest sense? An individual who is by nature spiritual. As the saying goes, we're not humans having a spiritual experience, but we're spiritual beings having a human experience. These are just some of the gems in this wonderful Bhagavad Gita as it is. Jai. Always lovely hearing from Prabhu. He's um, mm. when I, I sometimes you meet devotees and you realize this is someone who could be doing anything, <laughs> but they're doing right. Krishna consciousness. <laughs> and right. uh, Vaishasheka Prabhu, he's he's one such person. Bhuta Bhavana Prabhu is another such person. I, I'm I meet them, I'm in their presence, and I think they can do whatever they want, and that they've mm. chosen to do Krishna consciousness then says something about the value of bhakti. Right. And um it was so nice to hear him personally reflect on the gems that he's mm -hmm. received and, and taken with him from the Bhagavad Gita. And I think it's like an invitation for all of us to reflect like what, you know, what have I taken from Gita mm -hmm. with something mm -hmm. that's with me? Yeah. Making it personal. Yeah. It's very easy to um, fall into the kind of rote lines and uh, mm -hmm. religious tropes around scripture <laughs> Bhagavad Gita is good because Prabhupada said, and, and Krishna spoke it. And we we forget that we are meant to and supposed to and must develop our own personal sense of why we love Krishna's conversation with Arjuna. Um, so two devotees, actually, who we're going to hear from next, Radhagovinda and Kishori, are two of the leaders in the School of Bhakti, which is a beautiful creative effort to share Krishna consciousness and the, the message of Bhagavad Gita with a new generation of people in all kinds of creative ways. So I'm excited to hear what they have to share with us here. Yeah. I've been worried about you and the spiritual stuff. You're just wasting your time with this wishy-washy fluff. Get some booze, get some beer, party wild in the buff. Hit the sack, get some crack, let it loose and live it up. Listen to me, baby, don't you worry about me. I'm fine living life and so happy, don't you see? It's not wishy washy bluff, it's the one reality. Let it go, take it slow, I'm just trying to find me. Hey there, stop sleeping like a bear. You're missing out, I swear. Out, I swear. Listen, give up your drink affair, or end up like a bear. You don't want that now, do you? I really love parties and just chilling in the pub Getting smashed off my face, candy flipping in the club I get wasted and drunk and spend the night in naked stub It's not a bad life, I'm just trying to live it out you use up all your dough getting wasted and mashed And that Nikki doesn't love you, she's just stacking all your cash And then you gotta pay the bills and work like an ass If you're following the crowd, you'll just end up in the trash Hey there, stop working like an ass Just following the mess Following the mess Listen, don't waste your life away just to satisfy your life. She probably doesn't love you anyway. 
I hear what you say, but what am I to do? All the world's doing it, so it's gotta be true. Sex, money, drugs is what they all pursue, and they say YOLO, dude, when you're dead, you just boo. Stop following the crowd and just think of the goal. This life is a lesson of the science of the soul. You've been here before and you've seen it all, so why are you still here, stuck in the loophole? Hey there, stop living like an ape. Your mind's so out of shape. So out of shape. Listen to the wisdom on the stage Stop trying to escape Your mind's like a monkey man, you've got to control it Hey there, stop living like an ox And think outside the box think outside the box Oh yeah Listen to the wisdom and the talks It'll blow up both your socks Come on dude, there's more to life than just Doritos Hey there, stop living like a sheep, just moving with the herd. Listen, now wake up from your sleep, and let's get out of here. Hi there, thanks for watching. Please like, share and subscribe to our channel, Wisdom of the Yogis. bravo <laughs> that was fun <laughs> I, I i like how they brought lass mass and ass <laughs> tied them all together. It was super good. catchy and entertaining and yeah, yeah the the chorus like yeah R reminding us that we don't have to take ourselves too seriously to yeah. practice a serious spiritual life <laughs> Exactly. I will definitely be following them on Instagram. Yeah, yeah. Like, follow, share. Not only their channel, but also for World Gita Day, this World Sankirtan team. Definitely. It's a global effort, and we're all doing our small part to reach this huge goal of 2.2 million Bhagavad Gita's offered to the lotus feet of Srila Prabhupada, Panchatattva, and Sri Krishna for their pleasure. Haribo. Jai. Next, we'll be hearing from Kishori Jani Mataji, who is a famous kirtanir and um, shares the wisdom of Bhagavad Gita through her uh, social media platform. So she'll be sharing a little bit with us right now. Hare Krishna, everyone. Happy Gita Jayanti. Happy World Gita Day to you all. My name is Kishori Jani, and I just wanted to share a little message of uh, hope. <laughs> For any of us that are already accustomed to the Gita and for those of us that have never actually picked it up to explore what's in there, I just thought I would share that there's something for all of us in the Bhagavad Gita. No matter where we are on our spiritual journey, in our relationship with the Divine, in our relationship with Krishna, the Supreme Person, there's something for each and every one of us. And that is truly the, the beauty and the profundity, the, the profound wisdom that's available in the Gita, that there is a solution, there is an answer for every possible question that we could have. You know, I know it sounds a bit too good to be true, but that's how I feel. My experience of the Gita has been that no matter where I have been in life, whether it's an issue of my own mental well-being or whether it's an issue of um, raising children or relationships with other people around me, friends and family or work issues, no matter what I'm going through on a personal level, if I have a question that I really want an answer to, if I meditate on it and I open up the Gita, <laughs> there's some magic that happens and somehow the solution, Krishna provides that solution because it truly is like a gift from Him to us from our Creator, from our beloved Lord. He has, he has given us this, uh, this gift to all humankind, and, but specifically to those who are searching, to those who want to build a relationship with Him. It's a conversation between two best friends, Krishna and Arjuna, and you can see that the relationship, is, as it unfolds, there is love there, there is trust, there is um, so much affection on both sides that when you get this wisdom, you feel that same affection. You feel sheltered and nourished and um, 
taken care of. So not just is the Gita a huge treasure chest of wisdom, of knowledge, it is also just our ultimate shelter. It's like having a best friend, <laughs> someone who's always there for us and can truly understand us. Interesting, because the more we give ourselves to the Gita, to this wisdom, the more is revealed to us. Krishna reveals himself in different layers. So um, <laughs> I would really urge you that if you've never picked up the Gita, or if you, even if you have, um, we can always just keep going. It's like churning the milk and making it more and more condensed. The more we read, the more it gets revealed to us. Uh, so I invite everyone on this journey to go deeper, to even start the journey um, to understand the Gita and invite it into our lives. And as we can't think of a better time, the need of the hour truly is deep connection. And that is what the, the Bhagavad Gita provides in a very deep and profound way. So please uh, take up this opportunity, this wonderful festival is being put on, uh, and find that connection that we're all hankering and searching for. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Kishori Jani. I, I appreciated how she brought out the Gita's something we can go back to again and again. Mm. It reminded me of a verse that Krishna, he gives Arjuna this encouragement, make me your mind, intelligence, faith, and refuge. And mm. I, I've always enjoyed contemplating the nuances between the, what does it mean to make this information my mind, my intelligence, my faith, and my refuge? What's the distinction there? And refuge is like when there's nothing else, nowhere else, no one else that I can think of, I go there for my shelter. Yes. And I loved everything she said was so heartfelt. She was talking with her hands on her heart and saying, mm -hmm. you know, the Gita was like her best friend. And I, <laughs> you can hug, you can hug the book. <laughs> you can hug you the can Gita. Feel that. <laughs> yeah, you can feel the reciprocation from the Gita, mm -hmm. from Krishna's words. So mm -hmm. very beautiful. Reminds, yeah, and any any interaction with the Gita, we, we hear this that Prabhupada they, they hold the book, then they get benefit. And it's it's not something it's not like uh it's because they're relating to Krishna as a person through that mm -hmm. that vision of him, even as abstracted as their own consciousness might be. There's Krishna. Um, Mother Nidra, a famous book distributor here in um North America in Denver. She's Prabhupada's disciple and she's distributed books every day for the last 45 years. And it's not an wow. exaggeration. It's literally every day. Wow. And when she has her rolly book bag with her, she just puts a little Bhagavad Gita right on the handle so that anyone who's walking by, even if she's not able to speak with them, still they're getting that vision of Krishna in the form of his Bhagavad Gita. That's incredible. All yeah. these innovative ways to connect <laughs> people with the Gita. Hmm. Simple for the simple, right? So yeah. speaking of everyone who can connect, we're now going to hear from some children from the Gurukul, uh, which is connected with um, Bhaktivedanta Manor over in London. And these are going to be young people sharing their own realizations and appreciations of particular verses in the Bhagavad Gita. So it's, it's for everyone. Even a child can do it, as Prabhupada would tell us. So we're excited to hear from the children of the Gurukul at Bhaktivedanta Manor. This is a short video on the Bhagavad Gita by children from Gurukula, the Hare Krishna Primary School, without pre-preparation. <laughs> This is chapter 5, verse 29. A person in full consciousness of me, knowing me to be the ultimate beneficiary of all sacrifices and austerities, the supreme lord of all planets and demigods, and the benefactor of and well-wisher of all living entities, attains peace from the pangs of material miseries. This is what Srila Prabhupada says about this verse. The conditioned souls within the clutches of the illusory energy are all anxious to obtain peace in the material world. But they do not know the formula for peace. 
which is explained in this part of the Bhagavad Gita. Hi Krishna Mohini, hi Krishna Vasudev. Can you please uh, tell us what this verse might mean to you? This verse means to me that Krishna is in everyone and about peace. And Mohini, what about you? What does it mean to you? I think it means to me that um, we should be kind to others and, and don't be rude or anything. Thank you. At home, um, to study the Bhagavad Gita, I have a, a deck of cards called the Gita deck. And um, I pick one up almost every day and I try and read that verse and uh, discuss it with my mum and or my dad sometimes and uh, that really helps me to learn more about the Bhagavad Gita. Okay. Do you know why you're studying this verse at the moment? We do and it's because our focus this in December this month is peace. Okay. Mohini, how do you learn the Bhagavad Gita verses? When I learn the Bhagavad Gita that like I think of the verse I want to learn. I go to the page in the Bhagavad Gita and then like and then learn learn the verse line by line by heart and then do the same thing with the translation. <coughs> Szerintem a Bhagavad Gita azt jelenti, hogy, hogy kedvesebb legyünk egymásnak, és hogy ne egy, hogy, hogy kedves legyünk mindenkinek, és ne legyen uh, senki rossz, hogy valami. Hi Krishna Vidalt and Hi Krishna Janvi. Hi Today we're talking about Bhagavad Gita. So can you tell me please, um, what is the Bhagavad Gita? The Bhagavad Gita is um, the song of God and Krishna uh, spoke it to Arjuna to enlighten him on the battlefield, battlefield to en enlighten him to fight against his cousins. So why were the cousins fighting? Uh, Duryodhan wanted the kingdom which is rightfully the Pandavas so the Pandavas said that they'll have half the kingdom, but the Ryodhan does not like the Pandavas, which are, the, which are their cousins. So he, of, he challenged them a fight, so the Pandavas agreed to the fight. Uh, Janavi, you're from Botswana. Can you tell me about how you learned um, Bhagavad Gita back there in Botswana? We used to go to the temple as on Saturday morning, at least before Guru Puja, 15-20 minutes. We got homework to, uh, for, from verses from the Bhagavad Gita, and one of them was uh, 9.26, and we did a little play on it. Uh, we, there was Krishna and Balram at the temple, and... Um, a poor man came and he offered just a flower uh, because he had nothing else and he had devotion to give the flower. But then there was a rich man like with loads of wealth and he wanted to show how wealthy he was and give lots of money to the temple. And then in their dreams, uh, it was like, Krishna came to him and it's like you don't you didn't have to give me all of that all I need is devotion uh, I don't need like all the wealth or anything uh, I can appreciate just water or a flower only if it's anything if it's worship if it's as uh, offered with devotion um, so would you like to uh, say this verse about um, the fruit, the flower yes. and devotion? If one offers me with love and devotion, a leaf, a flower, fruit or water, I'll accept Accept. Uh, accept it. Thank you. And can you tell me, Vidat, what this verse kind of means to you? You don't have to give a lot to Krishna. All you have to give is um, love and devotion. You can give it through um, a leaf, a flower, fruit or water. Anything that little is, um, is fine. 
Um, you can also give big things, but it has to be with love and devotion and Krishna will accept it. Okay, thank you. Whenever I have any problems, the Bhagavad Gita helps me to understand more about why it, this is happening and how I can help myself feel better and uh, make myself feel more uh, <laughs> more connected dadvedi pari pratena pari prashnena sevaya upadek shanti jnanam jnani nastatva darshinaha just try to learn the truth by approaching a spiritual master acquire from him so blesses me and render service unto him the self life so can impart knowledge unto you. Wow, that's because amazing. He has seen the truth. Ah, oh, because we did it in our play also. You did this in your play? Yeah. Kajwiti Paripate Ness. So like Gaur said how so so how do we um treat a spiritual master? Dadvati Paripate na Paripashne na Sevaya. Just try to approach this learn. learn. Just learn. No. Just try to learn the truth. Oh, just learn. Just try to learn the truth. Just learn. Just try to learn the truth. Oh, okay. So, excellent. So, is there anything that you've learned from this verse? Yes. Um, To like... Um... You should have a spiritual master because it can guide you anywhere. Oh. Yeah, it guides you. It helps you. It helps you cross the stormy ocean. Is it? Wow. Is okay. This picture, not that one, this one, with the deer. This picture talks about Krishna. Um, Gora and Prisa, do you want to read what is here? Yeah. On the bottom. Always think. Of, of me, me and, and become my, my devotee. Worship me and offer your homage unto me. Um, this talks about Krishna in the forest. Not this one. This talks about Krishna in the forest and like if you serve him and um, sh take shelter of his love. Read the Bhagavad Gita every day. Because it can be good for your soul. Okay, go ahead. As you, as fontos, elolvasni a Bhagavad Gita, mert az jó a a lelkednek. How oh, uh, Gora, what language is that? And that's mine. Hungarian. Hungarian. And is the, is that? And you have a Bhagavad Gita at home that's in the Hungarian language? No. No? It's all English. Do you read at home yeah. English? Okay, excellent. And so it means it means to um it means if you read this if you read the whole of the Bhagavad Gita each day, chapters, chapters and chapters you will never die. You will never need. You will never need to die. You would go instead. You'll go back to Godhead. And this book is very beautiful. So, do you all have Bhagavad Gita at home? Yes, I have a Bhagavad Gita. Just the same. My dad has a Bhagavad Gita at home. Krishna's a lot. And I have the Bhagavad Gita at home and we keep it safe on the altar and we don't keep and we don't put it on the floor or throw it or putting it in dirty places. If you'd like to find out more about Gurukula please visit gurukula.org.uk. Thank you for watching our video on Bhagavad Gita. Incredible.
20 more minutes. That was super cute and also inspiring. Very inspiring. You could just feel the eagerness and enthusiasm they had to share Bhagavad Gita. Yeah, they want to flex the Krishna knowledge and it's really cute. <laughs> <laughs> they must be reading chapters and chapters and chapters. <laughs> Moving on to the ISKCON prison ministry, Great. which facilitates an ecstatic outreach preaching program, um, bringing the light of Krishna into the most darkness places under the guidance of His Holiness Chandramoli Swami. Hmm. Uh, and they're receiving books, magazines, beads, the Maha Mantra, correspondence with devotees. Uh, let's hear more about these phenomenal efforts. Was touching uh, prison ministry for those that may be unfamiliar is an excellent service to connect to if you feel like you don't have an opportunity to go out as often as you'd like or maybe feel uncomfortable approaching others uh, strangers so to speak these folks are literally sitting and they're sitting all day and they're having time to contemplate what's their life about and how could it be better and when they get a gita when they get Prabhupada's books when a devotee comes and visits them it, it truly changes their life. They're ready to be impacted in that way. They want to be impacted in that way. Um, we have one devotee here um, nearby. His name is Chandra Shekhar Prabhu. He's a Prabhupada disciple and he's been Chandra Mali Maharaj's right-hand man. In um, He's written over 30,000 letters to prisoners. And when you visit him, he has so many beautiful drawings and poems from prisoners who have sent him over the years, their appreciations of Krishna and Prabhupada's wisdom that he's bringing through this Bhagavad Gita. So, Big shout out to the prison ministry anywhere, anywhere in the world, anyone, anywhere in the world who feels inspired to try to distribute Prabhupada's books. And you're not quite sure, you don't feel comfortable again as an outgoing, gregarious person, how to do it. The prison ministry is lazy, intelligent. It's the most practically powerful way to get the books into the hands of somebody who's ready to read them. Okay, now I think we're going to go to Radhadesh from a prison to a castle, <laughs> anywhere in between. Krishna's uh, wisdom is poignant and important. So we're going to hear from Yadurani over in Radhadesh, who helps attract different people to come visit the uh, beautiful grounds that they have at the temple there, and of course, connect to the wisdom of the Gita. is unique in a sense that um, 
uh, we have a lot of visitors are coming here and then uh, we are um, trying to use this fact to, uh, to attract people to uh, come in contact with Bhagavad Gita. The tour guide is taking the visitors to several places in the, uh, in the, in the castle. So at a certain point he's offering them the uh, Bhagavad Gita. We have a dedicated room which is uh, for Bhagavad Gita exhibiting uh, a beautiful uh, print, big print of, uh, of the book. that people can experience the teachings of the Bhagavad Gita in an illustrated way and, uh, through the paintings and the diagrams. Books are also offered in the restaurant for people who are coming to the Mishanam and also in the boutique uh, where people are coming to buy souvenirs or whatever they like. There's also a beautiful presentation of the books where they can choose whatever is attractive for them. Another system of distribution is the smart box. There are, box. there are boxes which with books and the people can go through them and then they can pick up whatever they like and keep the, keep, put the donation in there, which is very um, easy to do and uh, it's working well. Another idea which is uh, working well is uh, we, are, we are using the, the help of the congregation that are living in different places in the country to, uh, to place um, Bhagavad Gita in the, in the street libraries. Uh, this, these books are placed and the people who are passing by and looking at these uh, boxes, they pick up the books and it seems to be very popular. People are very eagerly taking them. And, we're very happy about the system. Another way of distributing the books is to go door to door and uh, show the books to people and invite them to come to the temple and participate in the events or whatever they wish. A unique idea of uh, what is the Gita path uh, where people can uh, go through the forest and uh, in there they can uh, find uh, boards of uh, uh, illustrated uh, verses from Bhagavad Gita. They can read and contemplate on that while they're walking. A unique facility we have here, uh, just across the street, is the uh, Bhakti Vedanta Library Services, where a large uh, variety of, um, uh, of uh, uh, Vaishnava literature is, uh, is presented there, and then the, this shop is also providing uh, a huge amount of uh, books to uh, any uh, to devotees or distributing books in the area, on the countries, or actually all over the world. Just getting to read Prabhupada's books and uh, practice them, it makes all the bhakti yoga come to life. That's what I feel. It's it's uh, it gives the understanding of, the, of uh, devotional service. So it's very necessary, the devotional service without studying Srila Prabhupada's books, it's only half of the job. But when you actually also study Srila Prabhupada's books, which is one of the main limbs of bhakti, then you get to the spiritual life really comes to life, that is my experience. <laughs> When I came to the library, I took a book from Sri Prabhupada and when I saw on the back his picture, I, it really touched my heart and I took the book to home and uh, that same day I uh, st yeah, started to read the book and uh, lots of things about karma were in the site, so I, I understood that very clearly and the next day I became a vegetarian directly and so I thank Sri Prabhupada for this uh, gift he gave me to, yeah, to start Bhakti Yoga. Hare Krishna. Okay, I read uh, Sri Prabhupada's books and then I decided this is what I want to do with my life. So I came to this Krishna Conscious Movement and I started 
trying to, uh, to follow all the instructions. And I'm still trying. I'm still reading Grandpa's books. Still uh, don't understand it fully. My sense, it was meeting the devotees and meeting the Bhagavad Gita. It was meeting Krishna and meeting God personally. It changed my whole life from ignorance to knowledge. And being in loving connection to God, being in loving connection to the devotees and the knowledge made my life sensible and blissful. And now I'm happily reading the Bhagavad Gita every day. Every single day reading from the Krishna book, every day reading from the Bhagavad Gita. And it's a very wonderful fundament for a good life. Hare Bao. Radha Dam Ki Jai. <laughs> jai. So many innovative ways to distribute the books, like those street boxes mm. were really neat. And I think um, that would allow the inquisitive person to like, you know, seek out the knowledge like genuinely. And uh, it's amazing. Yeah, beautiful. Next, we're going to be hearing uh, from the School of Bhakti, jai. which is an educational hub. <laughs> what did you say? I, I said Jai. Well, the video that we saw was from them earlier with the dancing and the uh, the animal heads and the, the the hip hop. Right. And this time um, we'll be viewing a trailer about the life, the Gita life course. Oh, good. So, yeah. What do Albert Einstein, Will Smith and Mahatma Gandhi all have in common? The answer is they have all read, been deeply inspired by and found deep inner strength from the Bhagavad Gita. This 5,000 year old ancient text is as relevant today as when it was first spoken. It covers topics ranging from religion to relationships, science to sociology, leadership to lifestyle management. That said, if you've ever tried to read it, you've probably discovered that mining those gems of wisdom on your own can be hard work. That's why here at the School of Bhakti, we put together the Gita Life Course so that we can share Gita wisdom in a relevant, practical and inspirational way. The Gita Life Course will provide a chapter by chapter summary, an explanation of the key themes and a plethora of practical life lessons. Beautiful. Yes. Good to know that that's out there and available because I think many devotees feel a little uncomfortable handing mm. someone a Gita and then worrying now who's going to help them take the next step. Because as we all know, without the guidance of people who have inculcated the knowledge, it's very difficult to bring it into our own life. So all glories to that effort from the devotees over at the School of Bhakti offering this lifestyle course based around the wisdom of the Bhagavad Gita. Mm. For our last segment here in Europe, we're going to go back to the children and uh, hear some verses recited from some young people nearby London. Hi, Krishna, everyone. My name is Keshav, and today I'm going to be saying two verses from the Bhagavad Gita. I hope you enjoy. 2.7 Transonation. Now I am confused about my duty and have lost and have lost all composure because of miserly weakness. In this condition, I am asking you to tell me for certain what is best for me. And now I am your disciple, a soul surrendered to unto you. Please instruct me. Matras, Pasha, to go there, yeah. 
Sītoš tāši, ka tu kādā, Āgamāt pāri rovičās, Tam te tikšā švabārtā. I was one of Quinty, the non-permanent appearance of happiness and distress and their disappearances in due course are like the appearance and disappearance of winter and summer seasons. They arise from sense perception, those seen of Bharata, and one must learn to tolerate them without Every being disturbed. Hello everyone, I will recite a verse from Bhagavad Gita 9.22. Ananya sindayanto maam yejana paryupasate desham nitya biyuktanam yogakshe mam vaham yaham. The translation is, but those who, who worship my, my, with devotion and, and meditate on my transcendental form, I, 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 I carry what they lack and preserve what they have. For those. Bhagavad Gita 2.13. Dear Muslim Tadi, you know the other Tadi and Rabbi did it for Tadi Muid. Translation. As the soul pass from the full body to all it in similar way, the soul changes the body when we die. <laughs> Keshav and all the reciters, that was beautiful. Cute. Such sounds. <laughs> okay, um, we are concluded with Europe, and that was a beautiful presentation. Uh, I haven't gotten to spend much time there myself, but I feel more excited to do so one day. <laughs> by Krishna's mercy. And I'm also mm. very happy, Ishvari, that we got to connect. Thank you for spending some time with us here in Europe. Yes. Thank you for we're, having me. We're going to go down to South America or Latin America um, now and then conclude our World Gita Day celebration in North America. So do we have our Latin American host with us yet? Rukmini Mataji. Ah, Rukmini. Hare Krishna. <laughs> the hostess with the mostess, no doubt. <laughs> and we're also going to have Prema Rupa Madhava Prabhu. Oh, great. Uh, who has three wonderful names all in his initiated name. They could each yeah. individually be an initiated name. <laughs> but we have Prema Rupa Madhava Prabhu. So Good thank you. you Prabhu. Thank you, Deva Madhava Prabhu. We're going to meet you again in North America. And thank See you, you Shri Keshavi. Um, for hosting so beautifully um, through Europe. So welcome, Prima Rupa Madhava Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Dandavats. So we're so glad to have you here. Um, and we wanted to first take a chance to hear from you, actually, a bit about yourself and all the wonderful Sankirtan efforts that are happening in Latin America. Oh, thank you so much for the invitation. We are very happy. We are right now in the middle of the marathon, only like one week and a little more to conclude them with this wonderful service that everyone can be involved. So there are very nice and good news here in this part of the world. So yeah, here, for instance, in, in Uruguay, Uruguay is a very small country here in South America behind Argentina and Brazil. Mm -hmm. And we print in this year, 2021, uh, 20,000 books. For many, many years, this doesn't happen. And here are available books, Sharpropa books. So we are very, very happy with that news. And we are having uh, WhatsApp groups with many Latin American Sankirtan devotees. And we share pictures with the books and some Sri Prabhupada quotes about the importance of Sankirtan. So we, we can keep, you know, enthusiastic and we share with everybody. And that's wonderful also. And to prepare ourselves and to keep this service in our mind, in our consciousness. Last year and part of this year, we have a lot of lectures and programs all focus in Sankirtan, Navina Nira Prabhu helps us participate in giving wonderful lectures and tips for Sankirtan. So here we are. So 
the Bhagavad Gita life course that I saw there of, of the School of Bhakti, we gave this and uh, almost 100 devotees participate online in this Gita Ya in Spanish. It was the first time in the history that the, this Gita life course take place here in, in South America. What an America. incredible feat. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. They were everybody were very, very happy. We learned a lot and and we 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 have now this mood that we took from you know ISV and other places like devotees like to sponsor books that mm. was not very popular here in this part of the world. But little by little devotees start open the mind and say, okay, yeah, we cannot go out in the streets, but yeah, I like the idea to be part. So I would like to, to donate these books, to put it them in schools and libraries, prisons, hospitals, etc. And that was very, very interesting in this year. That's incredible to hear, Prabhu. And it seems that uh, Latin America is taking um, one of the goals that we have with World Gita Day um, to unite as one team. And though Latin America is, you know, a vast area that we're talking about, it seems that all the countries are coming together to uh, hit that goal of 2.2 million Gitas all across the world. And you're doing it so wonderfully. Uh, we really love to hear about that. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> if you're ready. We're, we're uh, ready to go ahead and see uh, in live <laughs> the action that's happening all across Latin America. Let's see that. Krishna, te he oído hablar en detalle acerca de la aparición y desaparición de cada entidad viviente y he comprendido por completo tus inagotables glorias. Por favor dime quién eres, quiero saber acerca de ti. Oh poderoso Arjuna, debes saber que yo soy el beneficiario de todos los sacrificios y austeridades, el Señor Supremo de todos los semidioses y el benefactor de todas las entidades vivientes. Quien sepa esto, encuentra la paz. Entiendo que tú eres el Señor Supremo, quien ha de ser adorado por todo ser viviente. Por eso caigo a ofrecerte mis respetuosas reverencias y a pedir tu misericordia. Ahora soy tu discípulo y un alma entregada a ti. ¿A qué se debe tu bondad hacia mí? Yo tengo la misma disposición para con todos, pero todo el que me presta servicio con devoción es mi amigo, y yo también soy un amigo para él. Mi querido Arjuna, esta forma mía que estás viendo ahora es muy difícil de ver, pero como tú eres mi muy querido amigo, es que estoy exponiendo mi instrucción suprema. 
el conocimiento más confidencial de todos. Óyeme hablar de ello, pues es por tu bien. Haribol, Hare Krishna, yo soy Bhakta Carlos. Vamos a hablar del verso del Bhagavad Gita, del 17, que dice así. Aquel que es regulado en sus hábitos de comer, dormir, recrearse y trabajar, puede mitigar todos los sufrimientos materiales mediante la práctica del sistema del yoga. Mi experiencia con el Bhagavad Gita es sentir una conexión muy profunda con Krishna a través de los significados de Sirla Prabhupada, porque él nos explica cómo relacionarnos con Krishna, sobre los detalles, y esto es una gran frescura que llena todo mi ser. Eh, hay una, una analogía que es la siguiente, que la vida es como un péndulo, y para poder mantenernos en equilibrio, el Mahamantra es la estabilidad. Entonces... Eh, Meditar en Krishna es lo que nos va a dar la fuerza para realizar todas nuestras actividades en el día. Es una oportunidad que se nos presenta para llevar nuestra vida espiritual en el ámbito del trabajo, del estudio, en la familia. Es lo que nos va a mantener en, en equilibrio, en estabilidad. Haribo, Hare Krishna, muchas gracias. Todas las glorias de la Prabhupada. 5.000 años atrás, la gran guerra estaba por comenzar. Dos dinastías de primos a la guerra fratricida se iban a enfrentar. Oh, Sanjaya, quisieron mis hijos y los de Pandu, y los de Pandu. Después de encontrarse en el campo de batalla de Kurukshetra con deseos de pelear, oh, Sanjaya. Arjuna, el piadoso héroe de la lid, vio a sus hijos, abuelos y maestros enrolados en alguno u otro bando y sus lágrimas y dudas inundaron el cenit. Y ahora estoy confundido en cuanto a mi deber y he perdido toda compostura a causa de una mezquina flaqueza. Y en este estado te pido que me digas qué es lo que es mejor para mí. Y ahora soy un alma rendida a ti, soy tu discípulo, por favor, instruyeme. Conduciendo su carruaje estaba Krishna hilando fino y enseñando al buen Arjuna los vaivenes del destino. El trabajo que se hace como una ofrenda para Vishnu debe hacerse, pues si no, el trabajo lo haga uno a este mundo material. Y siendo así, trabaja solo para él y así siempre libre será. Arjuna, temeroso de matar en la lucha a sus parientes, prefería irse al bosque y dedicarse a meditar. Y es que nadie puede dejar de actuar según su naturaleza. No, 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 no te reprimas. No, 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 no te reprimas más. Porque nadie puede dejar de actuar. ¿Cómo hacer para ser un buen caballero? Mente fría en el intríngulis. Motosierra que no daña, amoroso podador. Si alguien me quisiera ofrecer con amor y devoción una fruta, una hoja, flor o agua, yo aceptaré la ofrenda. O descendiente de Kunti, cualquier cosa que vos hagas, cualquier cosa que vos comas, cualquier cosa que vos des, todo eso debe ser hecho como una ofrenda a mí. Así Krishna incitaba al gran Arjuna a retomar su valentía y a actuar con osadía más luchando con amor. Abandona toda regla, abandona 
toda religión, yo te protegeré, ven a mí, no, no temas, no, no temas. Cuando Arjuna comprendió que el axioma del que nacen todas las buenas costumbres es simplemente amar a Dios, tomó su arco Gandiva y apuntando al enemigo dio rienda suelta a su valía ¡pah! y liberó a su corazón. Arjuna no fue un tal Bin Laden ni un verdugo inquisidor, él era un guerrero honesto, sin ni un rastro de posesión. Habrá dilemas que harán muy tenues a la luz de nuestra luna. Todos podemos ser héroes siguiendo los pasos de Arjuna. Gustán, un gusto comunicarme con ustedes. Mi nombre espiritual es Goran Adas. Soy iniciado por el maestro Gunagraji Das Goswami. Mi nombre artístico es Tatita Márquez. Soy uruguayo músico. Y el Bhagavad Gita, este es mi primer Bhagavad Gita. He tenido varios, distintas ediciones. Este Bhagavad Gita lo tenía mi tía en su casa, año 1998, y me lo regaló porque yo empecé a, a, a leer varios libros de la filosofía. En ese año y el siguiente empecé a, a cantar los mantras, a meditar, a, me hice vegetariano, bueno, la práctica espiritual y la filosofía. Y el Bhagavad Gita, este está conmigo desde, desde ese momento, si bien he tenido varios más y los fui regalando, este me acompaña desde, desde, desde siempre, esta edición la amo, y bueno, todo lo que, me, lo que he aprendido eh, en cada lectura, es casi una lectura diaria lo hago ahorita y es una fuente de conocimiento inagotable, lo he leído muchas veces de arriba abajo y, y ahora tengo como, busco capítulos especiales y los vuelvo a releer. Se los recomiendo a todos. Esto es lo mejor que hay. Muchas gracias. Hare Krishna. Hijo de Kunti Arjuna Yo soy el sabor del agua
incredible effort by all the devotees across so many countries. I know you mentioned Uruguay, Argentina, Prabhu, what are the other countries that were involved? Yeah, many, many countries here in Argentina, Uruguay, Mexico, Colombia, Peru, uh, Venezuela. So many, many countries are here in, in Latin America. Uh, we are very working very, very tight, everyone. Now we are doing like these kind of programs to encourage, to get more inspiration. So we are very, very happy. And we also ask for your blessings to continue with this and to try to get, you know, the, the goal that we put, the pledge. That's clearly evident through all the efforts that you made, both yourself, Prima Rupa Madhva Prabhu, and your wife, Prima Rupa Madhvi Mataji. Uh, we thank you both for the incredible feat of putting all these videos together, um, getting everyone united in one team. Since that's one of the themes of World Gita Day. So we thank you so very thank much you. for joining us. Thank you. Yeah, Premi, Premi was behind everything. This So thank you. Thank you, Anukul Seva Prabhu, for your inspiration and for give us this opportunity. And Siema Mohini also. Thank you all the, the team. Hare Krishna. Thank you so Hare much. Hare Krishna. The devotee love is just uh, ever expanding across um, all the countries that we've gone through. And we're excited to bring back Deva Madhva Prabhu. We can't get rid of him. It's now the North America <laughs> and the North American leg. It is the last leg of our uh, marathon uh, within a marathon across all countries across the globe. We've gone through Australia, Japan, Fiji, Th Thailand, uh, Africa this afternoon, um, Europe. And now we're in the last leg of North America. So welcome back, Prabhu. Thank you for having me. It's my one <laughs> thing I can take credit for is sticking around good souls like you. <laughs> Likewise, Prabhu. So we are going to get started with some kirtan, break it up a little bit. We Great. have the incredible youth from ISKCON of Silicon Valley, who are multi-talented and you'll get a chance to see with their uh, command over so many different uh, instruments. So take it away, Youth Jam. Krishna.
Tara, bye to you. That door is coming in there. Fired up. <laughs> Absolutely. They uh, certainly bring um, such an energy to what we've been presenting so far. So thank you. Uh, even though their name comes up as Jamulus, that is not their name. I learned that they're <laughs> the Youth Jam program. So I'm not calling you Jamulus, I promise. Beautiful. Uh, up next, we've got Gopal Hari Prabhu, who is sitting as the Distinguished Chair of Ethics at Aurora University which is a university here in the US. And he's written several books. He's on the Shastric Advisory Council for our ISKCON community. So we know that Srila Prabhupada wanted his books to get into the hands of academics. And many of the books have appreciations from academics uh, printed at the beginning. But Prabhupada also wanted that his own followers become those academics and bring the deepest sense of purpose into that arena. And so Gopal Hari Prabhu is one of the people on the front lines uh, doing that service for his own self and for the rest of us. So excited to hear from him. The Bhagavad Gita is taught in universities and colleges around the world. It has brought and continues to bring a spiritual revolution in the lives of millions of people. The Gita is a book of spiritual wisdom, a guide and a friend to the spiritual seeker. It provides answers to life's most difficult questions. Who am I? Why am I here? Why do I suffer? But the Gita is not just a book of philosophy. In a world overcome with turmoil, pandemics, and war, the Gita serves as a practical handbook on how we can live our lives to overcome suffering. The Gita presents a message of hope that although crises and tragedies may plague us at every moment, one day the sight of Krishna will occur, ending the repetition of worldly existence. The Gita teaches us to face and overcome all reversals in life by the strength of bhakti for Krishna. And it celebrates devotional heroism, the facing and conquering of unavoidable suffering through intensified devotion. The Gita tells us that the ultimate purpose of all our temporary suffering is eternal freedom and never-ending spiritual joy in intimate association with Krishna. Suffering is a means by which devotees, Bhagavatas, are understood to be elevated from already existing greatness to eternal glory. As models for ordinary human beings, saintly devotees such as Arjuna, in such conditions of adversity, underscore the Gita's message of hope that all human beings and indeed ultimately all living beings may become exalted, overcome the bonds of Maya and attain Krishna Prema, love of God by imbibing the Gita's vision. Incredible to hear from such esteemed uh, professor <laughs> and underscoring the uh, beauty and the message of hope from the Bhagavad Gita. So we're moving along here in North America and we're actually going to have uh, a session with four different people, um, ranging from new people who have been reading the Bhagavad Gita all the way to seasoned practitioners who have been reading the Bhagavad Gita since birth. Um, so we have in a segment called Impact of the Gita and we'll be seeing Anandamari Das Jugal from Boston, Gauravani and his entire family, um, Varangi Devi and Charles. And as I was mentioning, they're all from different walks of life. So we have a former monk in there, we have a multidisciplinary artist, we have a boutique owner and mother, a management consultant from a large corporation and a seasoned practitioner. So we're very excited to hear this next, next segment. Hi Krishna, in uh, celebration of World Gita Day, I'd like to share a little bit about what Bhagavad Gita means to me. Uh, I first came in contact with the teachings of Bhagavad Gita in 2010. I was a student at the university and I remember I uh, was very much searching uh, for some kind of consolidation of all the different ideas that I had heard and all the things that I had felt and all the kind of intuitions that I had about spiritual life and all the questions that I had yet to answer. And when I read Bhagavad Gita, it felt as though all of those things all of a sudden had a voice. 
when Krishna began to speak in the tenth chapter about uh, all, all, all the ways in which his glories are spread throughout the entirety of his creation, and that with a single fragment of his self, he's you know performing all of these miraculous things. Uh, I felt like that was one of the most profound things I ever read. Um, and specifically, one of the verses that really stands out to me, and I feel like um, speaks something that really no other um, book that I ever really came in contact with kind of spoke directly to, is chapter four, chapter four, verse ten, where Krishna says, uh, "All the all the great souls of the past, they ultimately have to give up fear, anger, and attachment." And in the purport, Srila Prabhupada's writing about uh, this fear of being a person. And so for me, Bhagavad Gita really opened me up to the personal experience of the Absolute Truth, and which is something that I had never come in contact with before yet. It was something that felt so natural and true to me. Um, so this is why Bhagavad Gita really means a lot to me. I mean, so much more could be said, but thank you. My name is Jugala and I'm from China. Hare Krishna, everyone. So the impact of the book Bhagavad Gita has been tremendous in my life. I've been searching for absolute truth, studying about like Buddhism, Taoism, meditation, yoga. But this book literally has the answer to everything from how did the universe come to creation, why are we here on earth, what happens after death, and how to progress spiritually. And uh, I realized that we're not here to fulfill our desires and uh, chase after material wealth, but to reestablish our connection with God. And after I received this book from my yoga teacher, I started slowly um, chanting and uh, going to Kirtan. So I'm eternally grateful to my yoga teacher, my best friend, and everyone else on this path. And uh, the best thing is that now I'm able to introduce this book to my friends and my clients and share this fountain of happiness with them as well. Thank you, Halibo. Life is filled with so many difficulties. Everything from politics to COVID to social media. But by studying Bhagavad Gita, I can help us through those difficulties and confusing times. Ready? Sarva Dharma Paritya Mam Ekam Sharanam Raja Aham Tvam Sarva Papilya Moksha Yashyami Ma Suchaha Abandon all varieties of religion and just surrender unto me. I shall deliver you from all sinful reactions. Do not fear. So how has the Gita impacted my relationships? So after reading Bhagavad Gita and studying it, I have learned that there is a higher purpose, that I'm living for a higher yes. And this shift in perspective has allowed me to realize that I am no longer acting or living for the sole purpose of enjoying my body or exploiting the things outside of it for my own enjoyment. So this naturally, um, obviously, changes the way in which I interact in so many different ways. The way I think, the way I speak, the way the things that I eat the way that I treat other people, understanding who we are, which is explained in the Bhagavad Gita, that we're spiritual beings, and we're living in a material world, a material experience, but this isn't really who we are, has allowed me to relate to others, you know, animals, people, even my own job and activities in a different way. So because of the shift in perspective, now my relationships have been naturally upgraded. I am no longer looking for what I can get or how I can be served or how I can benefit from something all the time. Of course, it's still there. It's a process. But even at my early stages of spirituality, I've already seen such a huge difference in the way that I process things, in the way that I think about myself, in the way that I um, interact with other people. The quality of my relationships is so different. It is um, beautiful to see how when you start working on yourself, when that perspective changes, you actually start attracting a different kind of person, a different tribe. And in my, in my life, I think that's the biggest gift that I've gotten from the Gita. So yeah, studying the Gita, 
tapping into this tradition has given me a spiritual family, a community, a tribe. And I think that's at the highest of relationships, being able to commune, to get strength, to be uplifted and uplift others um, just based on spirituality, on knowledge, on things that actually matter, on things that are real. Um, and really what's more real than tapping into our essence. And so that has changed my life completely and forever. And I'm forever grateful for my teachers and for my community because now I understand and I have an example of what a real relationship looks like. And it helps me develop myself for one day being able to have a real relationship with Krishna. So yeah, thank you so much for having me. Hi Krishna. With the upcoming World Gita Day, I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to share some of what I've learned by reading and discussing the Bhagavad Gita with my Bhakti community. The first of which is selfless service. Studying the Gita with my Bhakti community has really opened my eyes and mind to new opportunities to serve in my day-to-day -day life. One recent example of this is, I recently returned to my work office in San Jose, and I recognized an opportunity to bring food with me and offer it to the homeless people I encountered. The second topic I'd like to talk about is the three modes of material nature, tamas, rajas, and sattva. Tamas is the mode of ignorance and darkness. Rajas is the mode of passion and excess desire and activity. And sattva is the mode of goodness, peacefulness, and calmness. Having awareness of these three modes and how others and I am affected by these three modes has enabled me to shift my focus in various situations to be more peaceful and calm and share that with others. I've been able to see how, how I move in the world has changed and how I interact with others has changed in a positive way. And I'd like to share a quote from the Gita. The quote is, selfish action imprisons the world, act selflessly without any thought of personal profit. And with that, I'll continue to ask myself two questions as I move into the new year. And I invite you to ask yourself these same questions. What will I do to serve? How will I use my gifts and talents and material possessions for a higher purpose? Thank you. Wonderful well, segment. And, yeah, Charles ended on a very good note and a nice uh, meditation for the for the new year. Uh, a lot of people are making fun of <laughs> 2022, feeling like it's the same as 2020 um, yeah. in many regards. But uh, which it, what a nice meditation for for the new year and thinking about how we can serve others. Yeah, I like that. The, the two things he's holding on to service and the clarity that comes from seeing things through the lens of this framework, the three modes of material nature. I think that's something that we can all do a little more of. Mm -hmm. uh, we have now, I I'm guessing we're gonna hear Vishwambar Prabhu sing because that's what he's uh, exceptional at. He always brings such heart into anything he sings. And we have Vishwambar Prabhu of the Mayapuris singing the Gita Mahatmya, which is a beautiful glorification of the Bhagavad Gita that's found in the Shastra. Hare Krishna, my name is Vishwambar Sait. On this holy occasion of Gita Jayanti, I would like to share the Gita Mahatmyam written by Sripad Adi Shankaracharya. Shastramidam punyam Yapatet prayata puman Vishno padamabhap noti Bhaya shoka di varajita One who with regulated mind recites with devotion this Bhagavad Gita scripture, which is the bestower of all virtue will attain to a high abode 
such as Vaikuntha, the residence of Lord Vishnu, which is always free from the mundane qualities based on fear and lamentation. Gita Dhyayana Shilasya Pranayama Parasya Cha Naiva Santihi Papani Urva Janma Kritani Cha If one reads Bhagavad Gita very sincerely and with all seriousness, then by the grace of the Lord, the reactions of his past misdeeds will not act upon him. Malinē mochanam pumsam jalasnanam dine dine sakrit gītā mṛtasnānam samsāra malanāśanam One may cleanse himself daily by taking a bath in water. But if one takes a bath even once in the sacred Ganga water of the Bhagavad Gita, for him, the dirt of material life is altogether vanquished. Gita Sugita Kartavya Kimanyai Shastra Vistarai Yasvayam Padmanabhasya because Bhagavad Gita is spoken by the Supreme Personality of Godhead, one need not read any other Vedic literature. One need only attentively and regularly hear and read Bhagavad Gita. In the present age, people are so absorbed in mundane activities that it is not possible for them to read all the Vedic literatures. But this is not necessary. This one book, Bhagavad Gita, will suffice because it is, it, it is the essence of all Vedic literatures and especially because it is spoken by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Bharatamrita Saravasyam Vishnu Vatrad Vinishritam Gita Gangoda Kampitva Unarajanmana Vityate By drinking the Ganges water of the Bhagita, the divine quintessence of the Mahabharata emanating from the lotus mouth of Lord Vishnu, one will never take birth in the material world again. In other words, by devotionally reciting the Bhagavad Gita, the cycle of birth and death is terminated. Sarvo Panishado Gavo Dopta Gopala Nandana Partho Vatsa Sudhir Bhokta Duktam Gita Mritam Maha all the Upanishads are like a cow, and the milker of the cow is Sri Krishna, the son of Nanda. Arjuna is the calf, and the beautiful nectar of the Gita is the milk. The fortunate devotees of fine theistic intellect are the drinkers and enjoyers of the milk. Ekam Shastram Devaki Putra Gita Eko Devo Devaki Putra Eva Eko Mantra Stasya Namani Ani Karma Pekam Tasya Devasya Seva There need be only one holy scripture, the Divine Gita, sung by Lord Sri Krishna. Only one worshipable Lord, Lord Shri Krishna, only one mantra, His holy names, and only one duty, devotional service unto that supreme worshipable Lord Shri Krishna. Om. Tat Sat.
ஹரே கிருஷ்ணா Very much so. <laughs> yeah. He could sing the alphabet and I would still be just as mesmerizing. <laughs> exactly. It'd be like heartfelt. Tears would come. A, B, I think C. That's, <laughs> I think that's a, that's a challenge that we need to have for next year for Vishwam Prakabu. <laughs> can he do it? I think he can. Um, with that, we're going to move right along and we're going to hear from uh, more uh, esteemed professors and uh, dignitaries in one sense. Um, we'll have a Uh, no, sorry, <laughs> Dr. Vrindavan Priya Das. Um, and interesting story that I just got to hear or uh, read from his bio uh, through pursuing his PhD, first of all, PhD, which is a big feat in and of itself, but pursuing his PhD in applied physics that he came across um, this bhakti tradition while studying at Stanford University. So I'd really like to hear more about how that kind of came about in applied physics. And we're really going to get a chance to hear from him about the essence of the Bhagavad Gita. So very, very excited to have you, uh, Dr. Vrindavan Priyadas. Hare Krishna. Thank you for having me here. Om Ajnana Timirandhasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshura Unmilidam Jena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha. I thank you for um, giving me the opportunity to speak at this forum. Um, as the intro said, yes, I was pursuing my PhD at Stanford University and I was studying applied physics when I met the devotees and came across um, the philosophy of the Bhagavad Gita and it did change my life in a profound way. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about that and also um, speak from my own realization about the essence of the Gita. If one attends an uh, introductory college or a high school course in physics, Um, the most um, common topic, the first topic that one will encounter is to study motion, movement, right? The principal characteristic of this world, of the natural world, is, uh, is motion or movement. If you see the natural forces are always in the churn, they're always moving. The celestial bodies are moving, the sun, the moon, the earth, um, all the planets, they are constantly in motion. Uh, coming to living entities, you see that um, living entities, I mean, if you see a human baby born, you know, the first thing they'll start moving their limbs, start uh, moving their eyes, watching the world around them, trying to absorb information. They grow up, they start crawling, walking, running, and then um, the human society as a whole is not satisfied with human motion or animal motion. They invent automobiles, locomotives, aeroplanes, uh, and so on. So the fundamental nature of this world is rooted in this idea of motion or movement. But when I came to the Bhagavad Gita, it offered a paradigm shift in the way we think about uh, movement or motion. What it emphasized right away in the very beginning, Lord Krishna speaks this to uh, Arjuna, that it is fundamentally the living entity, the soul, which is moving through the experience of different bodies. So the changing bodies is basically uh, can be viewed as the soul moving through different forms of experience. And all motion in the mind, in the subtle body or in the physical body or in the world is actually a manifestation of this fundamental motion that that's taking place in the spiritual realm. So that offered a, a very different uh, perspective on the world. Uh, and, and that really captured my imagination. Um, I came to gradually see that the living entities are in the centric, uh, are in the center uh, of the Vedic worldview. It's a philosophical worldview. It's a description of the world uh, while keeping the living entities in the, cent in the center, not matter in the center, uh, which uh, otherwise is done in all material disciplines of study. So the Bhagavad Gita's essence can be described in, um, as a description of five essential aspects of reality. One is the living entities. They are in the center. They are interacting with the material energy that's called as Prakriti. The evolution, the combined evolution of these both takes place under the influence of time known as Kala. And this evolution naturally results in manifestation of the activities of the living entities and that's Karma. These are the four aspects of reality and all these four emanate from and are controlled by the Supreme Controller Ishwara. So jivas, the living entities, prakriti, material nature, 
Kala, Karma, and Ishwara. These are the five aspects of reality that Bhagavad Gita explains. The next question is, what is the living entity with this worldview supposed to do? And that's elaborately um, answered in the Bhagavad Gita. That's really the crux of the message of the Bhagavad Gita. The living entity is now supposed to establish connection to their, to their source, to the divine source, and that's the uh, Supreme Lord. You can call it Paramatma or Bhagavan in, in its um, ultimate nature. And this process of connection is, is yoga. And therefore, every chapter in the Bhagavad Gita is titled as some form of yoga. It's Sankhya Yoga, Karma Yoga, Jnana Yoga, Dharma Yoga, uh, um, Dhyana Yoga, and then finally Bhakti Yoga. So the whole uh, synopsis and the theology uh, and philosophical understanding of the Bhagavad Gita, it culminates in Bhakti Yoga, but it takes you gradually step by step through these different forms of, forms of yoga often referred to as the yoga ladder. The bhakti yoga, um, in essence, is unconditional and um, unhesitating surrender to the Supreme Lord and to engage in his, um, in his devotional service. Chapter 12 of the Bhagavad Gita is specifically focuses on, Bhag uh, on bhakti yoga, but the whole theme is built up throughout the text and it also culminates and concludes in, in Bhakti Yoga. Mai eva mana adhatsva mai buddhim niveshaya. This verse in the 12th chapter um, uh, reminds me that uh, one who places his mind on Lord Krishna and uh, resides uh, in him with his intelligence, such a person is sure to attain him and he'll always live in Lord Krishna. This is the highest position, this is the highest ambition this is the highest um, uh, kind of a spirit, um, destination that a spiritual aspirant can aim for. And the Bhagavad Gita offers a very tangible, a very practical way to achieve this. The end result is, you know, life, one's life is transformed. One experiences bliss in one's life, uh, some genuine sense of happiness and a motivation to share happiness, love uh, and kindness to all of mankind. Um, so I urge all the follow all the followers on this channel, all the viewers today, to dive deep into the Bhagavad Gita, uh, enrich your lives with its philosophy and uh, the practices it uh, prescribes, and share the same with everyone that you come across. Thank you once again, Hare Krishna. Thank you, Vrindavan Priya Prabhu. It's it's it's. When somebody with a strong intellect, Krishna says, one who worships me with their, in, uh, reads this Bhagavad Gita, worships me with their intellect. And you can feel the, the unique relationship between strong intellect and Krishna's presentation in the Gita when someone like yourself speaks Prabhu. So thank you for bringing that in. My pleasure. Thank you, Hare Krishna. We also have another professor um, who was a neighbor of mine not so long ago, Professor Abhishek Ghosh. Uh, and he, I just got the bad news that he's down in Florida now. A lactate seals everybody. And, <laughs> um, but I always love hearing from Prabhu, and we're going to now. Um, he's somebody that grew up in the culture of Krishna consciousness, and particularly Bengali Gaudiya Vaishnavism, and that brings its own special flavor. Um, somebody like myself, a convert off the streets, you know, living a very different life for many years before coming in contact with the Gita. Um, there's a nuance that comes through. When someone like um, Professor Ghosh speaks, somebody who's really lived it and breathed it, their whole existence, uh, it, it brings something sweet. So excited to hear from him now. Thank you, Deva Madhava Prabhu, for that. Are you able to hear me? I, we can, Prabhu. Yeah, great to hear you. Thank you for that very kind introduction. And uh, yes, I miss my neighbor from the Harmony Collective. Uh, but you're welcome to come to Gainesville. It's a beautiful place. Um, when I was uh, invited to speak on the Gita today, and I was told the theme is impact, the first thing that flashed across my mind was the asteroid that hit Earth and killed off all the dinosaurs, because, you know, that's what I'm constantly talking about with my daughter. It's like, you know, impact, what, you know, that's what an impact is. Uh, on, a, on a global scale, but that's a negative impact, at least for the dinosaurs. 
in terms of a positive impact, uh, another kind of a metaphorical asteroid hit my life. And uh, that was a book that my grandfather gave me when I was about I think, eight or nine years old. And he pointed to one verse saying, Chatur Varanam Maya Shrishtam Guna Karma Bhagasya. Right? I have created the four Varnas based on Guna and Karma. And this is the kind of training I received since you mentioned uh, I grew up in a Gaudiya culture. It, it wasn't fun. Uh, the, the, my grandfather pointed out, says, why would Krishna create such a cruel system like the caste system? So here's the book. Get the answer. Find out and tell me. And so that was the first time I read the Bhagavad Gita. And I found out it was not about caste. It was a trick question. I ended up reading the whole thing. And I had my answers. And Aguna and Karma does not mean that you're fixed by birth. The guna is a quality, your talent, and karma is your activity or your career. So based on your talent and your career, you have a certain uh, role to play. But even that, what your career and your talent you know, and the time and money that you put in and the money that you get out of it is impactful in our whole lives, right? We define ourselves by our careers. However, there is one more layer to that impact which is the existential layer. The question, why do we do what we do? Why get up in the morning? Why go to school? And I have so many students who tell me that I try to get through school as quickly as possible and skip through the boring parts so I can get to earning money, right? It's like, okay, why do you want to earn money? Oh, because I want to marry the girl or the boy I want. I want to buy the house that I want. It's like, why do you want that? Oh, I want to live, you know, happily. And why do you want that? Because otherwise, what's the point of life? It's like, okay, right, let's pause right there. You want all these things in your life so that you can have an impactful life of satisfaction, right? And I think we are trying to look for solutions at a place where you can't find any. And that's how I often introduce texts such as the Bhagavad Gita. And the copy that I have uh, now, and this is my favorite copy. Are you able to see this? This was hand printed by Bhaktivinoda Thakur um, from his lifetime. And he writes that when I was composing the Bhagavad Gita based on the commentaries of Baladev Vidya Bhushana, and by the way, that's the commentary Srila Prabhupada used to write the Bhagavad Gita as it is. So this is the source book. He said, I was working uh, all night and within a month, I went blind. And so he said, uh, and remember in those days, they didn't have a dictaphone, they didn't have electricity. So he was literally lighting a kerosene lamp and writing with his you know, ink pen uh, volumes of Vaishnava literature. And I... Uh, that's where I think the answer to why we do what we do is answered kind of tangibly, impactfully, and in a transformative way, right? And as we go deeper into the question of what is impactful for us and how can we be impactful for others, the, the one kind of linchpin to that question is, we cannot be impactful unless there is sacrifice. Look at the sacrifice of Bhakti Vinod Thakur. He literally drove himself to blindness composing the Bhagavad Gita. Srila Prabhupada you know, drove himself to starvation while composing his Bhagavad Gita, uh, 1100 pages manuscript, which got lost. And uh, from all that I know, he had an argument with his wife and she sold it to buy tea and biscuits, right? And so every decision we take, everything we do has an impact on the planet. The question is, is our impact leaving this planet in a better shape than we found it? And the stuff that impacts our life are those leaving us in a better shape than we are right now, right? And that is where the knowledge of Shastras actually come into relevance. 
If you think about it, at the end of the day, the Bhagavad Gita is a little piece of paper and ink printed on it, you know, with some words, but it's the ideas that are contained there that are impactful. It's only when we forget about this translation or that translation and we just go straight into the ideas and focus on just one translation that is translating those ideas into our lives. That's when the Bhagavad Gita starts working. That's when we see impact. That's when you know, we see that every saint has a past and every sinner has a future. That's where we see the Bhagavad Gita really come into play, right? So this is not an ordinary book. It is one of the most impactful conversations that happened on planet Earth. And it's so impactful that 5,700 years later, we are still talking about it. During Krishna's times, there was no American corporations. There were no yoga studios. There were no universities. There were no professors. Yes, there was education. There was farming. It was a rural society. But that conversation that happened so many thousands of years back is an existential conversation. Why are we here? What are we here for? Where do we go from here? What's the point of it all, right? And if I were to summarize the Bhagavad Gita in three simple words, three simple impactful words, the first would be dharma, the second would be yoga, and the third would be rasa. What is dharma? According to the Bhagavad, dharma is satya, socha, tapa, daya, the four pillars of a civil society, the four legs of the bull that impregnates the cow of Mother Earth, and then there is peace and prosperity. In fact, if you look at the genius of the Bhagavad Gita, and I'll give you a little pointer here, the, the first verse of the Gita starts with dharma kshetre, right? And so the first syllable of the Gita is dhar, dhar, and the last verse of the Gita says, yatra jogeshwara krishna yatra partha dhanurdaraha tatra vijaya sri bhutir dhruva nitir matir mama this ends with ma. So if you look at the first syllable of the Bhagavad Gita and the very last syllable of the Gita and you join them together, you'll get dharma, right? The book is about dharma. But dharma for what? When you practice dharma and you start interacting with the world on the basis of dharma, then depending on your guna and karma, you practice some form of yoga. And by the way, yoga is so varied that even your depression could be a form of yoga. Anything that connects you with your deepest level of existence, your Atman and Paramatman is yoga, right? So Arjuna Vishada yoga, Vishada means depression, dejection. He's feeling terrible. But remember, every crisis is an opportunity. And whenever we are faced with a crisis, we can either fight or we take flight. If we take flight, we've lost an opportunity. But if we fight, we've taken up an opportunity to do yoga, to connect with ourselves, to connect with Paramatman, to bring out the best that we can in a crisis. But why do all of this? Why dharma? Why yoga? Because of rasa. Rasa vaisa. That means we essentially are living sparks, the dynamic energy that moves all of the static energy around us. And why are we dynamic? Because the essence of us is to love and be loved, right? And so if we are to look at the Bhagavad Gita in these three simple words with Mahaprabhu explains as Sambandha, which is Dharma, Abhidheya, which is Yoga, and Prayojana, which is Rasa. It's just three simple words. You'd get the whole Bhagavad Gita in a nutshell, and it's actually quite simple and transformative or rather impactful, right? Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to share some thoughts today. And uh, if I have, I can take one question if anybody has any. Thank you so much, Prabhu. Um, Thank you. The, the characterization there at the end with Dharma as Abhide, or, um, as Sambandha, and then Yoga as Abhideya, and then Rasa as Prayojana, it's a very memorable framing. And I'm wondering if, most of the watchers are going to be Vraj Bhaktas at this point. So I'm just no. wondering how, how does that uh, framing relate to that particular rasa that most of us are aiming towards? What, what is the relationship between the Bhagavad Gita and Vrindavan? 
Well, Rasa doesn't necessarily mean Vrindavan. Uh, Prabhupada says, give me Vaishnavs like Hanuman and Arjuna. <laughs> Uh, who can get on the streets and, you know, fight the good fight. That's also rasa. So rasa doesn't mean pie in the sky when you die. Rasa doesn't mean escaping. Rasa means being present in the world. Uh, there is vira rasa. That means rasa of chivalry. Uh, that's also a spiritual rasa, according to Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. So somebody who is working at Silicon Valley, somebody who's running a Harmony Collective, somebody who's working at Wall Street, they all have their own rasas, right? But it's covered. Every living being has a unique rasa with Krishna. But because it gets covered by so many layers of conditioning, uh, it get, you know, we live in a warped reflection, so to say, you know, Bhagavad Gita chapter 15. Um, and only through the process of chanting and cleansing the heart, we discover our rasa. So how is rasa relevant to the person going to Wall Street? Well, uh, if you are looking at screen all day, uh, you know, instead of letting the numbers worry you, uh, you realize that at the end of the day, I'm dependent on Krishna. So that's Dasya Rasa, right? To the book distributor going out uh, during the Gita marathon and getting rejection. And I mean, you think about it, uh, being on the streets and being rejected by every single person is not a happy situation, but doing that sacrifice is also a Rasika experience, right? And so that's the, that's the Rasa of Dasya. Uh, or if somebody is running an orphanage, right? And to see that these are all little sparks of the divine, they are all children of Sri Krishna. Let me serve them well, right? Whether we are cleaning the bathroom, whether we are writing a doctoral dissertation, whether we are tilling the land, uh, rasa is integral to our life. It's not something that you get only in Vrindavan. It is, Vrindavan represents the highest form of romantic rasa, but that's not for everybody, right? So everybody has access to rasa. We are rasa vaisa. You know that Krishna is akila rasamrita murti. And I'll finish this uh, answer with a little um, rasika tika on the Bhagavad Gita. In you know when Krishna is talking about Brahman, in one place, a commentators point out that he's made a grammatical mistake. Instead of calling it Brahman, which is neutral or sometimes masculine, Krishna says Brahmi, which is feminine. And why would Krishna make a grammatical mistake, right? And so a lot of people rag their brains around this. And one of our Gauri Acharyas pointed out that, you know, even when Krishna is uh, counseling Arjuna in the middle of a battlefield, in his heart, he has never forgotten Radha. So that thing that Brahmi refers to Radha in the Gita, right? And so Krishna is Akhila Rasamrita Murti, the embodiment of all rasas, because he can be in Vira Rasa in the middle of a battlefield, but also have uh, Shringara Rasa, which is in Vrindavan. And that's why Krishna never leaves Vrindavan. But for us, mortal souls, I think we need to start with the point of dharma. And this is why Srila Prabhupada pointed to the four regulative principles, not as devotional service, but as the basic litmus test of whether you're civilized enough. Bhaktivinoda Thakur used to say, first become a good human being, then try to become a Vaishnav. Don't try to become a big Vaishnav, try to become a better Vaishnav, right? Um, so I think that's where dharma and yoga becomes more relevant, and then rasa comes as a gift. Thank you, Prabhu. Beautiful connection. And we also have to thank your clever grandfather for <laughs> inducing you to study ardently the Bhagavad Gita, <laughs> although for a different purpose. Uh, he, <laughs> he was he like you into paying attention in a very blissful way, we can all tell. Uh, like, thank you so you. much for coming in. Thank you so much. Thank Great. you. Hadi, hadi. I feel like I'm going to have to watch this segment again uh, with pen and paper at hand so <laughs> I can jot down all the wonderful gems that he just shared. Um, I, I'm genuinely blown away right now. I, I'm trying to. We'll have to make him his own continent next time, so he can just have the program. Exactly, <laughs> just a whole section for for Prabhu. I'd love that. Um, again, I think we all needed to have our our notebooks with us. Well, we're going on further um, with actually a Bhartnatyam piece. So we're very delighted to present a dance performance by Suprata Bhomik, um, and she will be depicting the various characters from the Mahabharat. For those who may not know. The Mahabharata is this uh, maha or a very large fight that happens that 
actually brings us to the point of the Bhagavad Gita where Krishna and Arjuna are uh, placed in the middle of the battlefield and this wonderful divine song um, is presented. So uh, we are very delighted to see that. So let's see Supratha dancing to the Mahabharata. Can feel the emotional yeah. turmoil of Draupadi um, in that scene, very beautifully depicted. And the arrows were flying, <laughs> and the prayers were being offered. Uh, yeah, uh, it was reminding earlier, we also saw a beautiful dance from a young woman. And it was reminding, I've, I like to read war books sometimes, Battlefield Strategy. And, mm -hmm. and strategists often talk about battle as a dance. And it's, it's a very appropriate way to convey the turmoil and the tumult and the ecstasy happening at the battlefield of Kurukshetra. Okay, we're going to move on now and hear from some moms who are on the battlefield all the time <laughs> and how they <laughs> take shelter. <laughs> yeah, how they take shelter of the Bhagavad Gita uh, to support themselves and to support their children. We have Bhakti Rasa, who's a mom from Texas, and she read the Gita while she was pregnant. And then another devotee, Sita Rani Devi, and she sits with her child and chants the Bhagavad Gita, especially the Sanskrit, and finds that that helps her child to make it through some learning challenges that she may have. Hare Krishna, my name is Bhakti Rasa Devi Dasi, and during the time I was expecting my daughter, I joined a Vedic scripture reading group for expectant mothers in which we read Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam. As we all know, pregnancy is a stressful time with a lot of hormonal, physical, and mental changes. And also, it has been said that the emotions that a mother feels can also be felt by the baby. And by reading the Bhagavad Gita, it just brought so much peace and balance to me. And I can see that these qualities have also transferred to my daughter. In general, she's a very happy and loving child. And it's all credit to reading these powerful scriptures. I really encourage all expectant mothers, fathers, and families to take advantage 
of these valuable books that have been given to us. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, dear devotees. This is Sitarani Devi Dasi. I am a special kid. Her name is Sanskriti. She is 12 years old kid. Today I want to share my experience regarding mantra meditation, how it helped for the special needs. I really strong feel that the mantra meditation, reciting slokas, reading Bhagavad Gita and reading reading stories from Bhagavatam, it's helped my daughter enormously. Reciting slokas, it's helped my daughter articulation level and uh, reading stories from Bhagavatam, it's helped her memory power. Especially with the mantra meditation, it's helped her remain calm. I really encourage other parents with the special needs to teach their children this mantra meditation. Let them chant Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, read Bhagavad Gita and read stories from Bhagavatam to them every day. You will definitely see some improvements on your children. Powerful testimony. Certainly, and, and uh, very practical use of the Bhagavad Gita and seeing it live in your child is certainly something special. Reminds me of seeing pictures of moms with like headphones on their bumps yeah. <laughs> and they're playing some classical music or something. So what's the best classical music to play? The song of God himself and let your child hear that. I think the those uh, companies that sell those headphones should be... Uh, then we should work with their marketing team to kind of get <laughs> them a, on the same <laughs> page. That's a great idea. <laughs> um, well, we've been speaking about the Gita and the way that it can impact your life on, say, a mental level. But we're now going to hear from two uh, amazing practitioners themselves um, who have been uh, able to connect the Bhagavad Gita and its teachings with actually the, the health of our own bodies, mind, and intelligence. So we'll be hearing from Radhavala Prabhu, who is a chef, an author, again, these devotees have many, many titles after their name. He's a chef, an author, a yoga teacher, and a life coach. Um, and he'll be speaking about how to assimilate the right diet to help us improve our health of our body, mind, and intelligence, as well as Gora Nataraj Prabhu, who is an Ayurvedic practitioner and consultant who is actually pursuing his PhD in Ayurvedic as we speak. And they'll both, again, be speaking about, speaking about how we can connect Gita with wellness. Wonderful. Namaste. Let me share a beautiful sloka from Ayurveda. It is said that to eat is human, but to digest, divine. Now you may be wondering how. When I read Bhagavad Gita, I come across this sloka which inspires me a lot about food and diet. There Lord Krishna says in 15th chapter 14th sloka, Aham Vaiswa Narubhutva so, in every living entity, the Lord resides as digestive fire, Vaishwanara. So, this fire helps us to digest the food. Now, if I eat something and don't digest, then instead of giving health, it may completely destroy my health. So, therefore, we have to understand the principles of digestion. So, what we eat, when you eat, we have to eat according to the strength of the digestive fire. In this way, we worship the Lord. And that helps us to gain a lot of health. Then Krishna says, Pachami Annam Chaturvidam. All four types of Anna, food ingredients, like right? solid, liquid, or something soluble, these are four types of Anna that we eat, or food ingredients, four food we eat, four types of food we eat. And that food, when digested, gives us prana or life. So in this way, I see Bhagavad Gita speaks a lot about health and wellness. Please do read. We are celebrating the Gita Jayanti week. So you can read, speak about it, spread the knowledge, spread wellness. A very happy 2022 to all of you. Hare Krishna. 
today is Gita Jayanti. As a consultant and a practitioner of Ayurveda, Ashtanga Yoga, meditation, diet, and pursuing my PhD right now in the field of Ayurveda on how to reverse chronic diseases by Ayurveda, lifestyle, yoga, and meditation, the principal words of my PhD is from the 6th chapter, 17th verse of the Bhagavad Gita, Yukta Hara, Krishna explains the process of living healthy, of how to overcome all pains, miseries and diseases. Eat right. Everything begins with eating the right diet. Yukta Vihara, right recreation, right exercise, right meditation. You should choose the right one with proper understanding, with a proper teacher. Yukta Chesta, having the right desires. Karmasu, right attitude towards work. Don't be greedy. Work detached. Compassionate in your life. Yukta Swapna, sleep at the right time, sleep well, prepare well and wake up at the right time. Clear your body, purify yourself. If you do all this in the right manner, then what does Krishna say? Yogo bhavati dukkha, all the pains, all diseases, all suffering in the body, mind can be eliminated and one can experience peace. And immediately as this chapter finishes, once you have achieved this, the next chapter begins with the Maya Sakta of Manav Partha. How can you attach your mind to Krishna? To attach your mind to Krishna, your mind has to be pure. So this verse tells us how to purify, how to balance our body and mind. So let us apply these teachings of Bhagavad Gita, become free from all difficulties, all diseases, just by applying this one verse. Imagine you apply all the verses of Bhagavad Gita, you can achieve so much more. Srimad Bhagavad Gita ki jai. Hare Krishna. Practical and helpful reminders. <laughs> we don't certainly <laughs> we can't only sit back and be armchair philosophers. We have to do the right practical things with our physical yeah. well-being so that our mental well-being can bring us to a place of experiencing our spiritual completeness. As much as I'd love to just sit and eat gulab jamuns and read bugs, <laughs> getting a sense. Oh, God said. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have uh, just two segments left and they're two very appropriate segments. Um, one uh, to conclude us, we're going to hear from His Grace, Vice Shaker Prabhu. But just before that, we're going to see some highlights of book distribution here in North America. And that's really the spirit of World Gita Day is to remind us that as an ISKCON society across the planet, unity and diversity, uh, Vaisha Sheka Prabhu reminded us a few days ago, diversity is the easy part. <laughs> Differences will always be there. But where can we find some unity? Where can we find some commonality? And Srila Prabhupada gave this mandate of book distribution being so dear to his heart, not only because it's effective for the public, but as we see, it's a way to keep us all together. It's a way to mm -hmm. keep us all feeling close and uh, a common sense of purpose that's healthy for all of us to support. So we'll watch some highlights of that from North America now. The agonizing pandemic has caused millions of people throughout the world to suffer directly from COVID-19 and millions more of their family and friends to suffer indirectly. To prevent further damage, governments around the world have implemented lockdowns, which have resulted in economic problems and severe increases in mental health problems like anxiety, depression, suicide, and drug overdoses. There's not only a serious, potentially fatal disease spreading rapidly and taking lives throughout the world, but there is simultaneously a mental pandemic in the making that urgently needs to be addressed. While our frontline health workers tirelessly fight the visible COVID-19 pandemic, there is also a dire need of compassion and inner strength to fight the less visible mental pandemic. To this end, we need well wishes like you to make this world a better place. One of the proven ways to achieve this goal 
is to tap into the universal wisdom of the Bhagavad Gita, a sacred poem whose title translates to Song of God. Great thinkers and leaders have always found shelter in the Gita's timeless wisdom. In the words of Gandhi, when doubts haunt me, when disappointments stare me in the face, and I see not one ray of hope on the horizon, I turn to Bhagavad Gita and find a verse to comfort me. The famous philosopher Henry David Thoreau reflects, in the morning I bathe my intellect in the stupendous and cosmogonal philosophy of the Bhagavad Gita in comparison with which our modern world and its literature seem puny and trivial. The Bhagavad Gita systematically presents universal wisdom to transform society both at an individual and a collective level. For example, the Gita offers techniques to transform the human mind positively by cultivating virtues such as maturity, balance, compassion, and gratitude. This inner transformation manifests outwardly into positive interactions with the society around us. In short, the Gita empowers us to transform our minds, our individual lives, and the collective world around us. The profundity of the Gita's wisdom is discussed in academic institutions throughout courses on conflict resolution, leadership, and management principles. The Gita's wisdom is inclusive of everyone, irrespective of nationality, race, age, gender, color, or culture. Our goal is to offer the panacea of the Gita for the welfare of individuals and communities at large, thereby alleviating the invisible mental pandemic. We sincerely urge you to join hands with us in making this world a better place by helping distribute the grace of Gita, G-I-T-A, a guide to inner transformation and awakening. What a great way to end um, our whole World Gita Day and further underscoring this point that Deva Madhva Prabhu just brought up right before about uni unity and diversity. We saw countries being depicted in that last scene, um, not just in North America, but all across the world in places like Japan and Pakistan that we may not ever have thought of um, having a copy of a Bhagavad Gita being presented to someone else. And it, um, it, it makes the whole situation very magical. Um, and I don't think that uh, magic will ever decrease in any way that uh, this Bhagavad Gita can be translated in so many different languages and can still be relevant to anybody. Um, you know, living thousands and thousands of kilometers away from miles. <laughs> I'm Canadian, I use kilometers, um, but uh, kilometers or miles away from, from us um, and be able to bathe in this uh, timeless wisdom. So we are going to have Vaisheshi Kapabu, who has been the uh, captain of and, you know, steering the helm of this, this ship, ship with the BBT, as well as the marketing team that are behind this uh, amazing uh, blissful World Gita Day celebrations. Um, and uh, before we get to that, before we get to uh, hear from Vaisheshika Prabhu, we just want to highlight that this uh, World Gita Day is part of another marathon called Live to Give. And its goal is to distribute and share these um, Bhagavad Gitas in every language possible, even if it means going to Antarctica for a little short trip, um, but giving it to everyone. And we're trying to hit and smash the goal of 2.2 million Bhagavad Gitas shared all across the globe. And that marathon is continuing on. It doesn't stop today. And if you've even watched a moment 10 minutes, an hour, or the whole thing like some of us have. Um, I hope you are feeling inspired and enthused to uh, be part of this uh, amazing uh, campaign. So if you are feeling those amazing <laughs> uh, adjectives, enthused, um, and ready to go, there are links if you're watching us on worldkeepaday.com, on YouTube, everywhere that you're watching us, you will see links on how to donate, whether you would like to get a copy for yourself, get a copy for a friend, family, pet, aunt, uncle, whoever it is, or sponsor a, um, a box so that other people can continue on that distribution chain and, and share it with everybody they know. Um, as well, I wanted to lastly point out that 
again, you're probably watching us on YouTube, mainly YouTube or on worldgeekaday.com. You'll see a little scroller at the bottom. These are all of the names that have been participating all across the globe. So you'll see many, many names. Uh, people are, are taking screenshots of when they see their name scroll by. So a huge thank you to all those participants. Um, as our last clip or our last uh, segment of today, we are blessed and uh, honored to uh, reintroduce Vaisheshi Kapoor. As I mentioned earlier, he has been uh, spearheading this whole project of World Gita Day to make sure that we are unified. And um, the battle cry this year is assume it can be done. So that 2.2 million Gitas, we assume it can be done, um, that we can not only hit that goal, but we can smash it. So very excited to hear from Vaisheshi Kapoor um, and get that last moment of uh, blessings and prayers that we can uh, meet that goal. Hare Krishna, dear devotees, please accept my obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. And thank you very much, everyone, for participating in World Gita Day. We heard from every continent of the world except for Antarctica. And everyone came together and participated. We celebrated the Bhagavad Gita. Not only that, we distributed it in mass quantities all over the world. World Gita Day is part of the Live to Give campaign that we do annually around the world. In fact, we're one world team working together. And this Gita Jayanti, which we've branded in such a way as to attract the general populace and bring in people from all walks of life who appreciate the Bhagavad Gita, is a means through which we can popularize the Bhagavad Gita on every continent. It's reasonable to do that. It's possible to do that. We can assume that we can do it. And it is one of the missions of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Bolo Krishna, Bajo Krishna, Koro Krishna Shiksha. We should teach about Krishna. And the best book in the world for doing that is the Bhagavad Gita. So we have the goal, and that is to bring Bhagavad Gita to every continent, to every culture and society in every language. And we're starting to do that now. Prabhupada put it in motion. He brought the Bhagavad Gita as it is, the most important book in the world. And now we're having it translated. And we've got lots of service to do together. So thank you very much, everyone who participated in this campaign to cover the earth with Bhagavad Gita. The Bhagavad Gita is especially important nowadays because people have lost their bearings and they need simple direct instruction about how to operate their lives. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna talks about yajna. This is reasonable when you explain it to people that you don't get happy by trying to please yourself. You become happy by trying to please Krishna, the Supreme. And you explain that actually Krishna's the roots and we're just the branches and leaves and we can't be happy without pleasing him. These are commonsensical points, but people never hear them. In the Bhagavad Gita, we learn about the three modalities and how they're affecting us in every aspect of our life. Our very minds are made of the three modes of material nature. So why wouldn't we be affected? So people get immediate clarity when they read the Bhagavad Gita. We need it in the world. It's the most important book for the masses of people everywhere. We should share the Bhagavad Gita. The most direct statement you'll find of, from Krishna about this is that in the 18th chapter, he said, there's no one more dear to me than the person who distributes Bhagavad Gita and explains it to the devotees. Well, it just so happens that the living entities are all parts and parcels of Krishna. They're just waiting to become devotees. And the ones who will listen, we should teach it to. And it should be systematic and should be regular and should cover the earth. So reading it ourselves every day, which is something Prabhupada asked us to do. He said, read at least one chapter every day and then try to share it with as many people as possible. And through the delivery system of the book, books are such an invention. They hold idea seeds. And when they go out into the world, the idea seeds spread out into the culture and they start new ideologies. Well, we need a spiritual ideology in the world. People have 
become confused about what spiritual life actually means. What is spiritual technology? How can I live my life practically in a spiritual way? They're getting all kinds of misinformation. Ultimately, that God is impersonal. They don't know that God is a person. So Bhagavad Gita teaches that. So all the teams that participated and all the devotees all over the world who helped in any way, I thank you very much for joining in this campaign. We're just getting started and we're feeling our strength as one united team all over the world. We'll be printing more and more Bhagavad Gita's. We'll be asking more and more people to participate and more people will come to Krishna consciousness from reading Bhagavad Gita as it is. So let's look forward to 2022 and we can start planning right away for expanding the work that we've done so far and finishing off this year with great gusto and smashing our goal of distributing at least 2.2 million Bhagavad Gita's. Thank you, Hare Krishna, and all glories to Srila Prabhupada. Jai Prabhupada. It always gets the fire going when we hear from His Grace Vaisya Shekhar Prabhu. And that famous quote from Srila Prabhupada, he saw a Sherwin Williams advertisement. And Sherwin Williams is a paint company, and they have a bucket of paint toxic as it is <laughs> pouring out over the whole planet and <clears throat> says cover the earth and Srila Prabhupada was in Detroit where I'm just down the street from when he saw such a poster and said that is Mahaprabhu's movement that's what we should be doing and Vaisha Shekhar Prabhu and team the one world Sankirtan effort the global effort to cover the earth in Bhagavad Gita <laughs> is that way by which people can come to recognize the value of Mahaprabhu's chanting. The philosophy reinforces the experience that they have. It's not just a fleeting feeling of happiness, but it's an intellectual, it's a, a rational, it's a lived paradigm that you can bring into every moment of your life, whether mm -hmm. it's in the classroom or with your children, or as Arjuna is experiencing, even on the battlefield, even in a place where everyone on the planet would agree, love cannot exist. Krishna, God himself, uh, argues the point that it, it can and it must. It has to exist there if it's to exist anywhere. And by connecting to that, we ourselves can be instruments in helping the whole world experience this feeling of God's love that he offers Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita. So huge thanks to Vaisha Shekhar Prabhu and team, uh, most notably Anukul Seva Prabhu, Rukmini, Sham Mohini, um, and, and many others who I don't know of, I'm just a talking head, but uh, Rukmini, if, if you could jump in and appreciate those people who deserve some appreciation, because this is truly, it's been a practically 24 hour kirtan marathon effort across the globe, glorification, Krishna Kata, it's uh, powerful. Well, thank you, David Madhavapu, for recapping, you know, just the essence of the essence of the essence of the Bhagavad Gita and one sense of what we're doing today at World Gita Day. But um, yes, a huge thank you to Anukul Seva Shamwani and of course, Shama Bhakti Mataji, who have been um, behind the scenes orchestrating things. But a special thank you to Ramananda Sakha Prabhu, who has been making this uh, broadcast seem like it's all happening very live. Secret, it's not all live. But <laughs> <laughs> for those who are thinking that it's been live, he's been the magic behind um, the whole entire broadcast. And um, he is a stickler for detail and you can see it in what's um, mm. what's been happening with, with the whole entire broadcast. A huge thank you again to all the organizers for the individual regions. Um, we are trying to expand. It's not always easy um, and, on, and we're not there on the ground either, but um, the organizers from each individual region have been putting timeless effort, not only to this program, but also at the same time, working on Sankirtan and going out on the street and distributing and sharing the Bhagavad Gita in so many different ways. So they're doing two jobs at once and still blissfully doing it. I don't know how they would do it. I would have pulled my hair out by now. <laughs> um, so a huge thank you to all of them and all the participants. We are ending off right now. We're officially signing off here in North America. 
but those who are still viewing, please, please stay on. It's um, You'll get a chance to see all the credits, all the hard work, and all the individual devotees who have been working together as one team to bring this World Gita Day together, but far, far reaching the whole entire uh, book marathon of distributing 2.2, or sorry, I should take it back, at least 2.2 uh, <laughs> million Bhagavad Gita's across the world. So a huge thank you and a Hare Krishna and um, prayers for everyone out there who is um, on the street right now, either in blistering heat or <laughs> blistering cold um, here cold. in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> or Antarctica, if you if you made the if you were so enthusiastic, you wanted to travel to Antarctica with Vaisheshika Prabhu's blessings. Um, you know, we wish you all the best and pray that you are able to bring this timeless wisdom to each and every um, house that you can, every town and village. Assume it can be done. <laughs> uh, thank you again, Deva Madhva Prabhu. It's always a pleasure to see you and serve with you and serve you. And I hope to do that soon. <laughs> I hope you can too, because it means I'll get to go to the Rathiatra in Toronto in person. <laughs> so that's my hope also. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, and Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.
Krishna. <laughs>